Welcome to Diffuse Congruence, uh, the American Muslim experience. We're just so honored uh, to have today's guest join us. Uh, Omar, I know you're like, you know, outside of yourself, so I'm going to let you kind of do the honors to kind of set the stage in terms of, uh, yeah, who we have and, and, and who we're about to speak with. Okay, awesome. Salaikum guests, uh, Salaikum listeners. I, I, would, I can easily say this is a dream come true. Uh, I've never fanboyed out so much in the several dozen um, episodes we've had. So this is a dream come true for me. Our first guest um, is a not, is the first non-American to be named to an all-star uh, game and start. And uh, he's the first non-American to win an NBA MVP, the first non-American to win NBA Defensive Player of the Year. In the 1993 NBA season, he became the one player in NBA history to win the NBA MVP, the Defensive Player of the Year, and Finals MVP award in the same season. He also won a gold medal for the U- U.S. Olympic team in 1996. He's one of the 50 greatest NBA players. Um, he's also been, of course, on many top five and top ten lists. And he is an all-time great basketball player, the, the league's all-time leader in blocks, and one of four NBA players to record an NBA quadruple double. Welcome, Hakeem Olajuwon, to our show. Wow. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum, brother Hakeem. Wa alaikum salam. I feel humble just to, to hear all this accolades. Thank you so much. Well, before we even start, I do have a big grin on my face, and uh, I wasn't I wasn't exaggerating when I said this is definitely a bucket list um, meeting and interview for me. I grew up in a small town in the U.S., uh, son of Im- uh, immigrants from India. I'm actually Pervez's cousin, but uh, there weren't a lot of Muslims there, to be perfectly honest. And uh, I was a huge basketball fan. Um, and so when you started really coming into your own, you were always a great player. But when you started becoming much more vocal about your Muslim identity, meant the world to me, I'll be honest. And uh, it gave me a sense of confidence in seeing somebody that wasn't just my parents. Again, I grew up in a very small town, not a lot of Muslims at all, very few role models. Um, so it really was meant a lot to me to see a player as, as great as you but also uh, exemplify Muslim character on and off the court and really be proud to, to say um, that you're a practicing Muslim. So welcome to the show. Like I said, I'm, I'm just super, Masha, super excited. Masha, I'm, I'm excited. You know. I'm, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, you know, my way of background, obviously, I'm a native Houstonian. Uh, so obviously the Rockets mean the world to me uh, or they used to when I when I lived there, certainly. And uh, I cannot tell you what the 90s uh, and certainly 1993, 94 meant to me growing up. Um, and on a personal note, you know, Brother Hakeem was always so generous with his time and um, with just the support that he gave young people, especially, I mean, I was, I was a relatively young man, um, uh, back when brother Hakeem and I met, um, sorry, see, I, I'm, I'm by habit. I just call him brother Hakeem. But, uh, when, when, it, when, when Hakeem and I, and, and I met, I mean, you know, this was a long, long time ago and obviously he had already been the NBA superstar he was, but he was just another person in the community. But, um, again, so supportive of the youth work that we were doing and the community work. And that's how brother Hakeem and I, kind of developed a friendship. I mean, I would like to call it a friendship and we became rather close. Of course, I, I've now since left Houston for 20 years, but we've tried to keep in touch every now and then. And every now and then I'm honored when I get a chance to uh, cross paths. And I was so lucky that this past Eid, Eid al-Adha, I happened to be in Houston. And lo and behold, I met Brother Hakeem, mashallah. Again, re, 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 you know, we re, re, reconnected. And so... Uh, one of the first thing I asked him was, "You have to do my podcast, please." And so, <laughs> <laughs> of course, so, yeah. So, thank we're you gonna... so much for making that happen. And, and you know, I want to go back to something Omar talked about growing up in a small town. You know, it's not just any small town, though, brother Hakeem. It's actually the small town where one of your biggest rivals comes from. Yes, uh, Omar. I'll let you. <laughs> fill That's the right. That's right. Um, so, I grew up in uh, Spokane, Washington. My dad is a professor at Gonzaga, and uh, John Stockton. Uh, is okay. a Gonzaga <laughs> graduate, and uh, they have their. They were at the time. This is the '90s, of course, when I was going to school there. They were huge John Stockton Utah Jazz fans. So wow. I was, I was uh, the staunch but so- solo Rockets and Olajuwon <laughs> fan, uh, watching all those games. And I remember. I remember. I can. I can tell you exactly where I was and when during a lot of those uh, rivalries. So, 
Yeah. And, and I mean, to tell you the truth, anybody who was a Rockets fan in the 90s know that two teams were always uh, like sort of the biggest sort of arrivals and, and, and thorns on our side as Rockets fans, which is uh, obviously it was the Utah Jazz and so Stockton. And also back in the day when we had the Supersonics. The Supersonics were also a Rockets killer back in those days. And so Omer was kind of right in, in that Pacific Northwest. <laughs> we'll Enemy territory. Into- Enemy territory for sure. We'll get sure. into it. I definitely want to hear from, from Akeem, Brother Akeem. But uh, we'll talk about the Suns game, the right, series as well. Because those, we'll those are some we'll of the best to watch. But we'll get there. We'll so, get yeah, there. let's let's start off by um, hearing – a little about your youth. I'd love to hear about you know your youth in Nigeria and your family background, um, and uh, specifically your first experiences in with with athletics. Wow, Bismillah. Yeah. Uh, going back uh, from my upbringing uh, in Nigeria, you know, Niger- in, in Lag- I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, and. At that time, you know, the, you know, Nigerian culture, you know, the, the culture is very, very strong in about, you know, manners and respect. Uh, but uh, the youth at that time, it wasn't normal to be religious or going to the mas- masjid, only for the older people, or the older generation, my parents. So sometimes you feel even embarrassed to go with your parents to the masjid because you'll be the only kid there. You know, that's kind of uh, the background uh, that we grew up. But uh, it, it was a, a wonderful experience growing up in Nigeria, I, Lagos at that time. Uh, the the house that I grew up in, we they have, uh, the, the way the, it, it was master plan where they have all these houses in the neighborhood, and they put a huge football field in the middle. So most of my friends we were born at, at the same time in that, that era, and we compete and play uh, soccer right in front of, our, uh, of the, uh, at the football field. So the competition, the competitive nature growing up is very, very strong. To see any any young boy growing up in Nigeria at that time doesn't play sports, very rare. You know, so everybody had to play sports, so very competitive. And not just playing sports, you know, grow, growing up uh, very skilled. You know, you know, in fact, uh when you when I, I traveled uh about two years ago, I was in uh, Morocco. And I see some of the kids playing soccer outside. I was amazed how skillful without shoes. <laughs> so you grew up in that kind of environment where you play sports and very, very competitive. Uh, it's, it's a shame if you're not competitive. So that was very, very important to have that competitive nature. You know, and that was just, you know, after we finished playing uh, uh, football, which is soccer. Then we form other sports, maybe eye jump or relay. So very competitive, all kinds of different sports that were just. So I grew up in that environment where sports was, you know, was the driving force. But didn't know about basketball. Never okay, so basketball. in those, um, you mentioned high jump and soccer or football. Um, were those two in particular? You mentioned them because those were, uh, you know, sport uh, athletics that you were involved in. I mean, I can certainly see. How later in your career that would pay off? No, just just those the kids in the neighborhood. Okay, right. Yeah, that, that just the sport where I jump. Uh, it's a makeshift. Plant the right, 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 makeshift <laughs> I jump. I get it. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, jumping. You know, on the on, 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 landing on the on 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 the grass. <laughs> no, right. no, no grass. <laughs> I I heard also was it handball and volleyball team, that you were into? That was team handball. Team handball. Team handball. Yes. You know, play. So I was playing all kinds of different sports. Sports was a big part of my life growing up. Right. But uh, so never then I guess basketball. the first time you picked up a basketball, or, or how does that come, come about then? I mean, how does your relationship, obviously, with basketball begin? Well, uh, in my final year in high school. Okay. You know, basketball was introduced to our school. 
they sent a uh, uh, few coaches all around the states, the different schools, to teach basketball before the national competition. So the, the Lagos State coach came to our school to form a school team. So they were going to all the classes to see the different uh, uh, players that, that look athletic, that play different sports. So I was already playing team handball for the school. So I was picked in my class with some of two, two, other, two, two of my classmates. So they put a little group together. Then they took us to the national stadium. And they have a program where two times a week, the boss will, will come from the stadium, pick up the players that were chosen to the, uh, the national stadium. And that's where I started playing basketball. And I was, uh, the first time I got the experience watching uh, guys play basketball, I was amazed to see a few of the guards there that was already playing for a long time for the national team, dribbling the ball between the legs, not looking at the ball. That was amazing. You know, the, the ball's coming right back, behind the backs, through the legs. So I was amazing. It's not looking at the ball. And it has control, full control of the ball. And that's one of the things I love about basketball right away. You know, that's how I started playing basketball. And so, and real quick, you know, uh, I heard somewhere, somewhere I saw, I saw that you had previously said that uh, Lagos was a very cosmopolitan place. And, you know, some people have in their mind, when they think of Nigeria, there's maybe they don't think of that. But I, I'd love to hear a little about that and tie that into how organized are all all these athletic events. I mean, in the U.S., it's super organized, right? You yes. you have teams and you have leagues and all the way up from at a young age. But what was it like in um, in, in Nigeria in terms of how this, organized the, it was? The, 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 the system is the Olympics, which is the ultimate goal. So how do you pick the players that qualify for the, for the, for the country, for the Olympics? So they start from the school, the grassroots, which is schools. Then they will, they will play in a city, which is Lagos State's now, you know, competition, all the schools. From there, they will pick the state team. Then there is a national competition, national sports festival, all the sports. It's like, it's like Olympics for the country. So it was very, it's huge to represent your states. That's a huge accomplishment. First of all, to represent your school, it was huge. Then you pick among the few players that will represent the Lagos State in the national tournament. Then from the national tournament, they pick the national team for the international game, that trial for the Olympics, which is, I went through all the steps. I, you know, I was picked for Lagos State team. For, the, for, for basketball. But basketball, because when, when they introduced basketball to our, our, our school, right, the coach, the basketball coach, is, is a Lagos State coach already. Right. So he saw the potential, the height, and the agility. Even though I didn't know how to play the game, but they gave me just a basic task. Right. <laughs> just, right. stand, just stand in the middle and block everything <laughs> that comes in. <laughs> Are you a, are you be, a soccer? Be the big man in the center. Yeah. Are you a soccer a basic, superstar at the at, at, like in terms of the high school level? Were you like, were you really good player? at soccer? So, already? You know, I, you know, I, I was not like a superstar, but for my school, you know, just if you make the school team, you have to be very good. Very, very right. competitive. Right. So I was playing team handball for the school, soccer, then basketball. Yeah. You know all it, sports. And I mean, Omar, you'll agree. I mean, if if we're being honest, uh, you know, you know, Hake, brother Hakeem had some of the best footwork uh, for a center. You know, for 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 a, for a big man in the center, you know, Hakeem, you know, Hakeem's footwork is like legendary, right? So yeah, I mean, that's the reason like we're asking is 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 it's come up so much in the past. You, you know, you hear about the footwork He's, from soccer. You hear about the hand, the you know, the ability to just hand, uh, toss the ball mm -hmm. around like like in handball. Uh, and when I say when I say team handball, 
they don't really play it here. You, know, you need to look at that. It's, it's, it's very similar to basketball. Yeah, yeah, it is. Like the sport, you're right. The, yeah, the very much so. Not not handball that people think that it's just handball the world. No. no. You have three seconds, double dribble. Some rules are very, very close to basketball. Very similar. It'd be like rugby and football or yeah, American exactly. football. Yeah. You know, right, right. The very analogous sports. Right. Um so then, um, so then, so at that time, Nigeria had an Olympic team compete. Sorry, a, a no, basketball no, no, team competing. They, no, they, they, now I made the Lagos State team. Then we went to the national sport festival. Okay. Which would give they give medals, gold medals, silver, bronze, just like the Olympics. So. They put me on the Lagos State team with all these experienced players. They've been playing for a long time, basketball. But I made it for my school as a project. They know that you can help the team. So they put me with these guys that have been playing for a long time. So I pick up the game rapidly. Then we went to the, we went to the uh, National Sport Festival, which we won the gold. We won the national, you know, that team. Then from there, I was selected to play for the Nigerian national team, which is the junior team, under 18, in mm -hmm. Angola. And that was, where, that was where I was discovered when I went to Angola. Mm -hmm. There was a coach there. He was coaching. He was an American coach. He was coaching a Central African team. Okay. He brought his team to, the, to Angola. He was the one that saw me play. Then he came to me after the game that uh, you need to go to the States. Just like that. I said, do you know anybody in America? I said, no. Do you remember the coach's name? I mean, I'm... Christopher Pond. Okay. Okay. Christopher I mean, Pond. that's right. I mean, that, that, that's sort of all of it. I mean, in terms of uh, he discovered you and, yes. and, and, and put that, planted that seed, right, yes. in your mind to, yes. to say, I can maybe go to America and have a shot at this. No, I mean, he, before he left to Africa, he, he met Coach, uh, Coach Lewis, University of Houston. So he told him, maybe you find who met, sorry. Oh, he had met Guy Lewis before he's, coming he's, to Nigeria yeah, or before coming players. to Africa. Right. He's oh, okay. So Guy Lewis told him, if you find any good player, let me know. Yeah. So he, so he, wow. told, he, so he, he called Guy Lewis from, from Angola. I have a player for you. So Coach Lewis said, if he's, a, if he's as good as you said, we offer him a scholarship. And that was the, that was the, because he went with me to the embassy in uh, Angola, to the consul general. This, this, this coach, you know, basketball is amazing. There, there are coaches all over the world that teach him, that coaching basketball that I, Famous, huge. The American coaches that are, that are not known in America. <laughs> People don't know them in America. They're not known in America, you said? No. Yeah, okay. Because they love the game and they're coaching international basketball. And they get a the job because they're American coaches to, to teach national team. So, so you're you're probably, what, 17, 18? Oh, All 17. of a sudden, this, so this new idea... Oh, going to America is like thrown at you and you must have been probably super excited to about all sorts of things. Right. And then of course you have to talk to your family. How, how did that all play out both in terms of your excitement as well in as Nigeria, then taking that idea to your family? Yeah, yeah. In Nigeria, it's always a dream to go to university in America for all the kids, everybody, sports or non-sports. So that was already my dream, but I didn't know how, how, how I was going to get there. I just know that <laughs> one day you wanted to be there. You know, day. Yeah. So that was a golden uh, opportunity. I didn't know it would be through, through basketball. The, that uh, he came to the hotel. He made an appointment with the Consul General, American Embassy in uh, Angola. So I went with him to the to the to the embassy. So they have two conditions. The Consul General, I have to hear from American coach that we offer me scholarship. Right. So he called from the from the embassy, he called Guy Lewis. 
So God Lewis, if he's as good as you said, we will give him a scholarship. So that was good enough for the Consul General. Then wow. the challenge there that we were in Angola. They cannot give me the visa because I have Nigerian passport. Mm -hmm. So I have to go back to Nigeria to get, to get the visa. So we called the Consul General in the in Nigerian embassy that when I come back to Nigeria, that this gentleman is coming, you know, he gave me his, his, his card and called this man and everything is arranged. So the coach, the only question he asked me, if I get you a visa, can your parents buy you a ticket to, 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 to go to America? I, I told him, they will find the money to buy me the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> the most important is to get the visa. So Got that was it. arranged from there, yeah. So to answer Omar's question, I mean, your parents were very excited about the prospect of you going to the United States. They were so excited. But the, there was the only challenge, as you know, in Nigeria is about education, mm. academics. Right. So they don't believe that they will give you a scholarship to play sports. That was to convince my parents that I, I will, I, they already promised to give me a scholarship to play sports was something that on out of because it's always about you know you can only get academic scholarship not for right sports. right so that was right. a big uh, uh, challenge for me to convince them to buy the ticket first because they told me that I was told get bring your passport and your tickets to the embassy so my parents now they want to see the visa first before they buy the ticket <laughs> 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 so that was a big challenge where I didn't want, I couldn't, uh, they, they didn't want to do it to commit to buying the tickets. So I was uh, sitting on the, on, the, on the couch and my, uh, I, I couldn't go to sleep that night. So my, my mother, uh, late at night, she went, she went to sleep. Late at night, I tell you, she got up. And she was so, she was a, she was shocked to see me still sitting down there. Yeah, I was sitting in the same spot. I didn't move. Right, but I couldn't convince them. Then when she saw that, she said, "Go to sleep. We get you to get tomorrow." That's all the evidence they need. That's, wow, yeah. that, that is that is a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, you know, brother Hakeem, like, and we'll and we'll touch on this later. But you know, you mentioned something, and I didn't want to just leave it there before we you know, shift into your, your uh, years at the University of Houston uh, is uh, about kind of your religious upbringing and kind of the religious culture, really, of, of Nigeria. Um, and so, like, ha have you seen that in your own lifetime now? Have you seen that change? Have, have like, has, you know, have, have more young people become, you know, more religiously involved? And, and how has that changed well, in the, Nigeria? There is the, the, huge uh, transformation. Okay. Yeah, because before, you know, when we think about going to America, you know, like we have major tribes in Nigeria, which right. is the Aousa, they are from the north. Okay. 90% 90, 90, 90 are Muslims. Right. Then we have Igbo from the east, 90% Christians. Then the south is mixed. So, people in the south and the east is going to England or America. That's the destination. But the north, the destination is Mecca. Wow. So, when we talk about going to America, we are not talking about religious activity at all. It's more education and, you know, that, you know that's the direction. Sure. So, the, the the surprise to see in America to see that you can practice you learn more about Islam you can, this is was a, a strange you know, when you, when, I, when I went back to visit are you coming from back from Mecca or from America it was <laughs> because <laughs> right people that go back to from that go back to 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 Nigeria they want to they want to be Americanized and to show Western. Western. And that's what's cool. Right. You know, so the transformation is how to 
let the youth know that the value of Islam in the life of a Muslim, especially as a youth, you know, to make to make to be everybody want to have that uh, unique uniqueness about them, and they go about trying to do things to get attention. Sure. But if you have those qualities as youth, give you the mature mind, the respect, the character, you know, the culture, you're unique, but in a, in a very positive way. So That's I see right. a lot of youth now that, you know, Islam is the comfortable being a Muslim. But as you know, it's still, it's still always a challenge because, you know, uh, in every level, not just the youth, every level. Just like Omar uh, was saying earlier, that it gave him confidence when you see somebody else, uh, you know, that in a, in a, in a public, a public pop, uh, person that expresses their, expresses right. Their, yeah. you, know, you know, I, what he is, what is said, I, I didn't realize, you know, most of the Muslims that you that have, you know, that met, talking about Ramadan when I was playing. This is huge to the people. I didn't realize the impact until you oh, yeah. hear from yes. people. And now, some of them now, some of them now, they have children. Their children were not born, but they tell the children the story. That's right. I mean, yeah. I mean, my kids, so my daughters are, are like, well, one of them especially is a big basketball fan. But I mean, so she was certainly not born when you were playing. But I mean, you know, knows enough about basketball history to know who you are. And then again, how you wore your faith on your sleeve and, and, and you know, made Ramadan, especially in fasting in Ramadan, kind of a part of the American conversation. Um, you know, I don't want to embarrass you by saying that, but I mean, I, it's, it's the truth. I mean, I think you, you know, a lot, I, I attribute to a lot of people's familiarity with Ramadan and Ramadan fasting and so on for people who are basketball fans. I mean, I'll be honest. And and that came from you, Brother Hakeem. So, um, alhamdulillah. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, I, just, I wanna, just, sorry. Just, just to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Like if, if you could do it while playing at that level. And I, I remember games where you were hanging on the net and you were so <laughs> tired. So that, that stuck in my head big time. Then, then I could go to school and among, you know, being the one kid out of 700 in my high school, I could talk about, here's what Ramadan is. And you saw Hakeem doing it, Elajuan doing it on the court. I kind of do it, of course, you know, and so on and so forth. Right? You could have those conversations because Marv Albert was, was talking about, or uh, Bill Russell was talking about it on NBC. So I could talk about it with my friends, right? Wow. So, so that's the, and it, to me, it's more, uh, it's not just something that, something that just, he didn't realize the impact. Mm. You know, when I, I, just like I said, when I was growing up, my parents, they did not really enforce the religion. You know, they gave us, you know, as long as the cultures already cover a lot of it, the respect right. you know, that you have. The Ramadan is more like, you know, the, all the kids, they love it because it's, it's, everybody's doing it's the, the spiritual part of this is really, you didn't really get it. Right. But, you know, when I came to University of Houston, you know, when I arrived there, all of a sudden you have that freedom to be able to be able to do things without your parents. You know, so to have that kind of freedom, the, the Islam come in later because you start losing the values that you know that things you start seeing things around that you know that your parents don't you know you not know, mm -hmm. accept that you don't accept that so you start going back then you discover the reason why the importance of it right so that's why you know I look at it from how dangerous it 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 was that our parents give us good fundamentals, but not enforce it. They make it like, a, you know, it's a choice. Instead of saying, right. you know, instead of letting them let you know that it's an obligation to, to realize so It becomes a gamble. When it becomes a choice, it becomes yeah. a bit of a gamble with the next generation, right? right? 
And and I think what you're what you're explaining or what you're describing, you know, brother Hakim, is, is something like you said. It, yeah, it certainly affects young people, but I think people of all ages, which is, you know, they want they don't want to stick out as being uh, obscure or you know not cool, right? You don't want to be uncool, and oh, so cool. religion is uncool. Like being going to the mosque, like you said, even in Nigeria, is yes. uncool. uncool. So how do you change that in the culture? And I think that happens with. And we've seen that. I mean, I saw that in my own life where, you know, if I didn't have the right peers, you know, going to, you know, sign out mosque, right? I mean, I, I, I'm telling you, brother Hakeem, mm-hmm. like going to, you know, Masjid Taqwa, going to sign out mosque wouldn't be considered cool. But luckily, you know, I had the right friends that we used to, you know, going to going to the mosque was seen as being cool. Yes. Going to going to the club on Friday night wasn't so cool. I mean, at least. Yeah. Month, like you know, that, like yeah. That. So, you know, you, that, that's what you have to shift. Um but but you know I want to come back to and and, and we'll and we'll kind of infuse the conversation brother Hakeem with conversations like this. But I want to kind of take where you know in terms of at least chronologically where you were going. Um, so when do you get to Houston now? Because I know I mean this is late seventies or early eighties. Oh, seventy nine, nineteen seventy nine, nineteen seventy nine. Yes. And so you're at the University of Houston, my alma mater. So I'm proud. Uh, one of the things I am proud about is, is the fact that I, I share alma maters with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, University of Houston. Uh, go Cougars. Uh, anyway. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, so uh, your early years playing basketball were, I mean, you know, like, I mean, I think you'll agree, like kind of uneventful. I mean, you were certainly playing, you know, you, 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 but you saw also you weren't getting as much game time. And so I think there, there's a conversation that you have with Guy Lewis early on, and he tells you to maybe like work on your skills with Moses Malone, right? I mean, is that kind of, do I have the chronology right? No, not, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 that this every summer. Okay. At Fond Day Recreation Center, you know, uh, downtown. Moses, what is it called? Fond Day. Fond, okay. Fond Day Recreation Center. That's where all the big players in the summertime they play. Really. The pros, okay. all the players that play in Europe, very very competitive. Wow. So when I first came, I was seventeen years old. Yeah. So they, I, I need a guardianship by law. Mm. I'm under 18. That's right. So the, so the assistant coach for University of Houston, his name is Terrence. Terrence, they put me with his family. So I was staying with his, with his family. So he told me that in the summertime, I'm going to take you to Fonday. He's going to play against Moses Malone. <laughs> <laughs> because he plays, it's, it's a pickup game. Everybody can play. But you won't get a chance to play Except your you you real player because all the best players are there as a pick up game. So I couldn't believe that Moses would come down there and play. And for those who like are maybe basketball fans now may not even know who Moses Malone was. I mean, I mean Moses Malone by that time already was a legend. Yes, yeah, he was he was the MVP of the league for many years, you know. So that summer we went to Fonday. As he said, I saw Moses. So I was introduced to Moses for the first time. I was amazed because this is Moses and Kareem were the, 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 the best big men in the league. And I was just coming in as a freshman. So that was the first time I met Moses. Then uh, the pickup games. And pickup games is not going is it wasn't like where oh we are playing against a freshman. No. You know, you want to stay on the floor. If you lose, you're out of the game. I mean, your team would go, would sit out, and you wouldn't get a chance to play again for a long Pick time. Up games. <laughs> and, and what's your game like? I mean, this is obviously before the the Dream Shake was uh, was invented. Like, were you just learning how to shoot and do fundamentals? What, what, where was your game at at this point? The experience that uh, when I when I first came, you know, as I mentioned before, when I was in Nigeria, I was playing with guys that. Uh, they put me on a team with the guys that they've been playing for a long time. It's like a little click. They were not known in the mainstream, but basketball has been global because when I played, when I played, I mean, went international basketball to Angola and see all the teams and the countries. Basketball was huge. That's that just, that just in Africa at that time. 
So, but it wasn't on the mainstream, like they say, it's a global sport now. It's been a global sport for a long time. So when I was playing three on three in Nigeria, these guys that I play against are very skilled players and experienced. In the beginning, they, they were trying to shoot over. And they realized that I was going after every block and going higher above the rim. So they got smarter where they would come in and dish off. Then I would come back down and go back and get the second one to dish off too. Like, uh, so it was kind of practice where I was getting better and they were getting smarter. So before I blocked a shot, before the shot I was blocking easily before, sometime I had to go jump two or three times against three different guys to get a basket. So they were very skilled. But when I came to Houston, I was not known. So these guys were coming straight up to the basket. So I was blocking the shots easily. So immediately, I established as a force, as a shot blocker. So that gives you a presence right, right away in the middle. And that was one thing that Moses complimented me about when, they, when, they, when after they, I played against him. And the, the reporters went and asked him, how is that kid? He saw the relentless how you go out, how to protect the rim. That this guy, we do uh, incredible well in college. He was very, very impressed with my, the way I run the floor. So it, very, it was very complimentary, you know. And that's how every day at Fond Day in the summertime, playing against Moses, it was such a huge where you're playing against the best big man in the, in the, in the league. And it was not taking it easy on me either. It was bigger, stronger, and, you know, I was paying the price, playing against Moses. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that gave me huge com uh, confidence that uh, if I can compete against Moses, who's going to be that, that kind of skill and big in college? I should be able to do many college basketball. So I was very, very comfortable going to, as a freshman, you know, uh, playing uh, in, a, in a, a college basketball. Yeah, and, and and you're probably super immersed in basketball at this point. But any any anything you want to share just about like your observations coming to America? What did you did you get homesick or anything like that, or was it just like totally immersed in basketball, not looking back? And I mean, no. as a Houstonian, I'm I'm curious. Like, are you living on campus? Or are you living near campus? You know, if you can kind of situate yeah. even kind of where you are in Houston. Right. I mean, at least for most a lot of our listeners, and for certainly myself, you know, yeah, um, yeah people have Houston connection. The the adjustment was great because as I, as I mentioned earlier, I was 17 years old, so I was living with a family. So they have, you know, three kids. The, uh, the assistant coach and his wife. Right. So, you know, he's going to practice in the morning, take me to campus, go to my class. Then after after school, pick up games. Then in the evening, you know, ride with them back to the house. So I was more like living with the family. So that was a, you know, a very good transition. Then my second year, I said I wanted to stay on campus now. I was 18. So I was in the Moody Towers. You remember Moody Towers? <laughs> of course, the Moody Towers. Many a night that I spent hanging out with my friends in Moody Towers. <laughs> so that was what my, uh, you know, I know some of the players, uh, the local players, that they were anxious to, uh, to get an apartment outside, you know. But I thought, you know, living on campus was the best experience. You know, you have no responsibility. You don't have to pay any bills. You know, uh, on on the on the weekends, all these huge oak trees. You know, going to, to when you, when you walk in the uh, in nature, going to to, to, the, to the gym, or going to the cafeteria. You know, on campus, just beautiful. It's less people. But you see, during the week, during the week, during the week, there's a lot of people on campus. On the weekends, very quiet, there's big trees. and So that experience in the weekend is great. So I was not looking forward to just leave campus and get an apartment to pay bills. Yeah, yeah you're right. Absolutely. And now, is Clyde, Cl Clyde Drexler, of course, is he already on the team with you? 
Yes, he was. He was a year before me. Okay, and then also uh, Samson. No, no, Samson no. Is, Samson's Samson from Houston. Virginia. Oh, sorry, Houston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Sorry, yes. sorry. Ralph Samson comes later. Okay, so uh, it's you and Clyde. Uh, these are the days of the Phi Slamma Jamma, of course. And uh, just to kind of fast forward a little bit also, 1983, uh, you're the NCAA, um, I think, MVP of the, of the finals. Player of the year, yeah. Player of the year, sorry. Player of the year. Or was, so or actually, you, you can confirm. What, what was, it the, was it the tournament tournament player of, the, of the, the year? Or the, in fact, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing that we look at uh, up till now, till today, I was the last player that won that title that on a losing team. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and uh, that one. so <laughs> something something that Houston fans know only so well, you know, like we've got these amazing players, and yet we don't have a championship team, right? <laughs> but those but those championships, you know, not not winning the championships those two years probably just kept you kept you hungry, uh, kept and, you and hungry. Think, That's yeah. right. In fact, and we'll get to this, but one of your you know talk about rivalries. I mean, you lose to Georgetown, yes. and you face off against Patrick Ewing, a yes. name that will certainly come into play later on in your career. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, so yeah. Sorry, go. I, I, you know, I, I really would love to capture because I think you know, oftentimes a lot of these conversations get mixed, like mixed out. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, when when you are being interviewed, I imagine. So, like, how is like, like Omar asked, I mean, how, how is it adapting to new culture? You talked about like having that kind of foundation of being able to live in a family situation early, early on helped. Um, but how are you acclimating to life in America in general? Like, okay. and, and you yeah, can okay. certainly, that's, even that's, just you, even the food, like, did you miss your mom's food yeah, yeah, and of course, of course. Uh, little you know, things like, like that? Know, I mean, uh, and, you, and, yeah, and I, as I, much I, as you're comfortable sharing, you yeah. can talk about how you're also negotiating your faith. In, yes, yes. You know, the, at, yeah, at that time. Sure, sure. The, the, uh, uh, the advantage in Nigeria, uh, if you go to a day school, meaning you go home every day, it's like you're not serious. About, you're not serious about education. So boarding school, when you leave primary school, is boarding school. So oh, okay. everybody, everybody in Nigeria at that time, you know, in boarding school, boarding school that's that's like just a norm. So really? okay. I went to boarding no. school. For, I left home since when I was 12 years old. My my my, my after my primary school, my secondary school is boarding school. So that's where I was discovered. Oh wow. So I was already, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, in fact, independent. I, my, yes, my first year in boarding school was more stressful because you know the parents take you and they drop you on, on, on campus now. Then they stay with you for about another two hours. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> all the parents have to leave. Then you see all the kids are crying by the gate. <laughs> the, the first day, <laughs> then right. the second day, after about four days. Yeah. You start seeing less and less, you know. Yeah. Uh, Homesick. Yeah. Oh, then, oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Less and less students. Still, okay. Yeah, because they're still crying for their parents. Then about a week later, if anybody goes there, people start laughing at them. So you're forced to, 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 to be matured uh, now without your parents. You live on campus. So my experience in Nigeria, in boarding school, was a huge advantage when I came to the U.S. So living on, you know, on campus or living with the parent outside is something like whether you already have a, 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 a experience, but the culture is different and the people are different. So, for example, something that's very, very simple, like I went to breakfast uh, with Coach Lewis the first uh, the first day. And it was cold. It was cold in, 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 very early in the morning. Uh-huh. And we were at the hotel where they brought a glass of water with ice. And it was cold outside. I couldn't believe it. Coming from Nigeria. <laughs> you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> very early in the morning, right. they pull outside and they brought ice, you know, a glass of water with ice. I could not believe anybody would drink that. Things like that, the culture, that you don't think it becomes like normal for people that grow up. Right. Here. But for, like, for me, it was like, they put ice, cold water, in, early, early in the morning, and it's cold outside. So I have to adjust to the culture and to the people. And also, when uh, the players that are, uh, that are, you know, my teammates, after the uh, practice, everybody gets into their cars and drive away. I was surprised that they have cars. The play- students. Because in Nigeria, to order for you to have a car, you have to right. pay the price, meaning you graduate from college, you got a job for many years. I mean, to, people are driving a car. You, you, you have to go through the steps. And I see a player, a college player, have a car. And, ba- and back then, not just a, a small car, you know, those huge Cadillac, like big, big or uh, uh, Chevrolet cars back then. So that was, I was shocked that everybody had a car. That wasn't a big deal. Where in Nigeria to have a car, even some of the some of the teachers in school don't have a car. <laughs> Our teachers in school. So the culture and things that are exposure yeah. of, of yeah. saying things like that. You know, and I, I think it's also worth noting, I mean, Houston, University of Houston specifically is kind of known and still is kind of largely a commuter school. Yeah. So I mean, there's not a lot of life on campus. I and mean, a lot of people kind of get in, you know, like like me, you know, you would get in your car and you would leave. I mean, yeah. if you had people that you knew staying at Moody Towers, you know, you would hang out, but otherwise you would just go back home. But right. uh, it's fascinating. Um, now, are, are you, have you interacted at all with the Muslim community in Houston at this point? No, because okay. at, that, at that time, I was more concerned about the nation of Islam. And, you really? Know, yeah, I didn't I was know more, that. I was more concerned about that because I didn't see the Muslims on the mainstream. I only knew about the nation of Islam. Wow. And I, and I right. definitely you know, try to not to get into that uh, way, get, get confused. That's right, because you knew the differences. Right. So I was not comfortable. So I was just, you know, just yeah. another student, just playing. Yeah. You know. And that's super interesting. So, okay, so two championship um, losses, and but a tournament player uh, of the year. Uh, and, of course, you're learning and becoming better and better at the game. You decided to go to the NBA. I think you went um, a year early, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, um, my junior year. Okay, so I, what I'd love to ta- ta- touch on, this is something I've always kind of, part of me, you know, as a kid, especially fantasized about was, there's a story out there that there was a possibility of, in the draft, um, the three of you, Jordan, Drexler, and you, all ending up on Houston because, of course, you were the first pick. Uh, the The Blazers had Drexler and Jordan ended up being the third pick. There was a rumor that they that they could have traded uh, the pick and Drexler to Houston. So, and I know you've talked about that in the past, maybe in your book. If 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 you you know just for fun, uh, did you have any thoughts on that or any memories of that, or is that you're hearing that for the first time? <laughs> I mean, that I'm, is that, that is such an inside basketball to borrow an expression <laughs> like question that only Omar could ask. I, I told you, uh, yeah. Brother Hakeem, Omar is like a legit fan. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that, that's a very inside basketball question, Omar. But anyway, I yeah, love yeah. it. I'd love to hear it. Uh, and and you know, you mentioned a point which is a little bit of trivia, but I mean, one that I think some of our listeners may find interesting that you know when, when Brother when, when Hakeem was drafted in 1984 the NBA draft. I mean, you had Jordan in that same draft uh, and you also had Drexler and, you, you know, and alhamdulillah, like, you know, Hakeem was the first round pick. Uh, yeah. And Drexler, that, was, that so year. Drexler anyway. was the year before. And so the, oh, bo- sorry. the Blazers, okay. the Blazers were going to trade Drexler and, and somehow the Rockets would have also gotten the pick um, that, that ended up being Jordan. So basically all, all three right. it was, players you know, would have I, ended up on the Rockets. I got confused, yeah, because it was Jordan, Stockton, and Barkley that were the same year as you. Yes, that's yeah. correct. But yeah. the, 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 you've seen now the first pick, 
as you know, that the, uh, the Blazers, they have uh, the second, which the, the, you know, people don't realize, you know, at that time, if big men in the draft, he's going to go above any guards. You know? So yeah. that was no. When you have a big man in the draft, it's, the, it's automatically the one, the one player pick. And uh, the we already have Ralph Sampson. So yeah. if they traded uh, Sampson to, to Portland for Drexler and the pick, then they can pick one and yes. two. Which we, right. they, we, they will pick, which they will pick uh, 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 Jordan automatically. So yeah. I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine three of us on one team. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe people, maybe it would have turned out to be a very. <laughs> it would have turned out to be very boring because you probably would have won every single championship for the next several years. But, but who knows, not, right? Every... Be, but it may not turn out to be that because it depends on the chemistry. It depends on chemistry. And we're going to get to this when we talk about, I mean, it's funny you mentioned Jordan, right? I mean, because Pippen and Hakeem play on the same team for a little bit, but that things didn't go as, as I think we as Houston fans would have hoped. So, um, uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, um, I, Omer kind of took the conversation into talking about now the NBA. Um, and so you're, you know, you're, you're in a sweet spot because you played college in Houston and you got to stay in Houston after, after, uh, after getting drafted by the league. Um, do you want to kind of talk about that early transition and what that was like for you? Yes. I mean, it was, that's, that was one of the main, uh, driving force that I enter into the drafts because you seen have a chance to win the, the, the the coin flip to pick one or two, but you just had the feeling that this is my best chance to stay in Houston. So I came out. I, I entered into the draft, and uh, Houston won the, uh, the, uh, the the coin flip at the first chance, uh, first first uh, player pick. Uh, it's always a dream of any player if you can play college, you know, in one city, and also get a chance to play your professional career. In the same city, really? So, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's always because some of the players they don't even, they don't even have a professional team in that town, so they have to go. Oh uh, yeah, start, start a new life, you know. So it's very rare to be to be to be able to be in a city that you really want to that you play college and you stay there. So, so that was a another blessing to my last that uh, you know, if you look at my whole journey. You can, you know, this is just, uh, that was a cutter, the destiny that was meant to, to, to happen because I can, I cannot plan it any better. That's why I I've planned everything and, uh, I was just executing it. <laughs> everything was already planned because, you know, when you write a, a story as a, a story book, you would think it's just a, this is just a, you know, a very tale, but in reality, you know, I lived it. And, and you're the very first pick uh, that David Stern, the commissioner, the longtime commissioner for many years of the NBA, he, that's, you were the first pick that he ever uh, was commissioner over, correct? Yes. And uh, we came into the league at the same time. And, uh, <laughs> you know, commissioner. so that's why I was flew down. They flew me down in, in uh, this last year in New York. With the same kind of attire that I wore in my in my um, my draft day, to close out the commissioners last year to appear as a surprise at the draft. That yeah, that was wow, great to see. Th- that is amazing. That is such a like interesting little bit of uh, trivia that I don't know a lot of people knew. Um, uh, so when so when Howard Stern, I'm mean, not Howard Stern, sorry, when uh, when when David Stern was Stern. like yeah yeah was 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 retiring. Um, you, you attended the ceremony and, and the that's last, what you wore. No, the last draft. Last draft. Oh, the last draft. Sorry. Yeah. The last pick. I believe the last pick of the last draft, the, his final yeah, draft. Yeah, right? the, the, the last pick of the first round because the, the, the first draft was me. So they, to close out the last draft. That's that was, right. You, yeah, so the, uh, the NBA arranged 
He flew me down to New York. You know, make sure you, you know, dress the same as I, <laughs> I, I did. Yeah. With my tuxedo and the red bow tie, you know, <laughs> so the same way. And the commissioner he didn't realize that, so it was a surprise to him, you know. So that was a that was a yeah uh, that was huge. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. So tell us about those first few years in the NBA with the as the Twin Towers. I mean, you made it to the uh, the finals in '86, right? Not too far off, and um, think you know. The the the, the th- things were going very well in the first few years. Tell us a little about those first few years, even though you ended up losing yes. to the Celtics. Yes. What was that the, like in the first few years? The you know the uh, that's another uh, milestone because it was a groundbreaking in the league to have two big men playing side by side. You know that's why the Twin Tower was born because you know Rafa and I playing side by side normally. Is a center and a power forward, but to play two centers and play them together, you know, that was a you know a trend at that time that everybody now starts to adjust to find two big men playing. So it was great, you know, playing on that team because we play with a lot of experienced players. In my rookie year, you know, we won about maybe forty something games. We were in the playoffs, and we lost in the first round. And we lost to Utah in the first round. And that team, we, we, we lost, but it was very painful because we know that we are better than that team. And uh, at that time, you can only, it, it was only five-game series. So the beat us was the three, uh, three, two. No, 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 no. But, yeah, best of three. Yeah, best of five, right? Three, three, one. Best of five. Yeah, three, three, one, or three, yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, three, two, uh, three, two, three, two. Yeah, the Beatles, three, two. So, the but the following year, we we played the finals, Western Conference Finals against Lakers because Lakers won that year. They won a year previous year. They won yep, the in eighty five. They, they beat they beat Boston. Yeah, that, that's so, right. Eighty five. Yeah. yeah. So we it was a it was a huge accomplishment in the Western Conference Finals to play against the Lakers, and we beat them four uh, one uh, to go into the finals to play against great Boston Celtics with all the you know experience, Larry Bird, Parrish, and Mikael. Which was a you know dynamic team. So we lost to them for two. So you know it was amazing to be able to get to the finals again. You know in early year my you know, my career, my second year in the league, we went to the finals. I thought that's yeah. right. And then yeah. that Boston team is considered one of the best teams ever. So yes, the, yes. the fact that you even you guys did pretty well. Actually. Well, even and and and, and we're st- and we're also talking about the Lakers of the eighties. Uh, yeah. So 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 Kareem is there. So you, you match up against Kareem. Kareem, Kareem, Magic, Gilles Magic, Curry, of and all of them. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they yeah, yeah, all of them. But I just mean like match up between you and Kareem. I mean, just that that fascinates me. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, also uh, one of the Since uh, you know that when you look at all the all the big men at that time, you know uh, Kareem, uh, Shaq, David Robinson, Patrick Ewing, and in that era, and none of them play against each other. But I got a chance to play against all of them in the, in the finals. Yeah. I played against Kareem in '86. I played against. Uh, uh, Ewing that is so true. That's so true. I played yeah. against yeah. Western Conference with David Robinson and the final conference with Shaq. So I met all of them. Yeah. Wow. None of them play against each other. Yeah. And and we'll we'll touch on this uh when and I'm gonna really fanboy out when we talk about the nineteen ninety five playoff run because in that in that uh playoff you beat pretty much all the superstars of that of that time frame. Um you know, because you came as the number six seed and beat 
all the top, you know, the, all the top, basically your four competition were top seeds, all the top seeds. Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that. But yeah. but uh, I'm in a totally fanboy out when we talk to that guy. Well, That's my all time favorite playoff run. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and as a as a Houstonian at a heart, I mean, I, I'm very eager to get to 94, 95 as well. But but I guess then I, I would defer to you then, Brother Hakeem, like if you want to kind of like we want to shift the conversation there, but I I, I want to also be mindful of anything anything that you want to share in terms of what's going on in your life in that period. I don't want to skim over it. Um, so whatever you think is uh, well, you know, yeah, that, that you would love to discuss this. So so we're leaving things off in 1987 now, right? So because because you've wrapped. So we just talked about the finals. Um, yeah, it, 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 in that year, you know, like when I first came to the league, you know. You will, you're going to be tested. You know, they're going to get physical and you know, tested and to, to test you if you're, you know, this is, and, uh, and that's amazing also that people see the transformation of Islam, practice Islam, you know, Islam, how you, how, when you're young and, you know, short temper, you get in the fight, you get tangled, they see that. Then when they see, you know, instead of practice Islam, they see that the calmness, they, they see maturity. So my, my, my old journey, you can see from my youth, from uh, college, and when you start to practice Islam, and they, and they see the transformation and the peace. And people that, all the reporters write about that and about teammates. You know, it's amazing the way where, you know, it's not to paint a picture of where you come in there and you've always been good. No, because you do, you have short temper, you, you know, you're competitive. And it, when, you get, when you get tested, you respond right away. I know you get into a lot of fights, you know, in the league. But these fights, it wasn't because I was the aggressor. I was just not to be intimidated. I was very competitive where I was going to fight back. And when it's on the fight, I don't mind to... To, to get into the, the physical fight. Then I, I, then I get a lot of technicals from the referees. Yeah. They're not calling the fouls. But once they see the Islam, and start practicing Islam, they just see the transformation in your, in, your, in, your, in your dealings and your character and your calmness. So the people write a, a lot about this. They see the growth. You know? Yeah. yeah. And we so, saw it. Yeah, we saw yeah. it, you know, Amazing. because, yeah, I mean, when I was, like I said, when I was a kid, um, I, you know, I, I knew exactly who Akim Olajuwon was, but I had no idea that you were Muslim. So I was, you know, I was, I was a fan of um, the league for sure. But then we started seeing that change in you. Uh, and I'd love to, and, and you even changed to make it official. You added the H on your name. Yes. And you became a lot more vocal about your Muslim identity and your, and your practice of your faith. But yeah, yeah. for you, what was it? What was that? Was there a, a moment or an event um i've heard you refer to hearing the adhan i've heard i've heard different yeah. stories but i'd love to hear it from you we'd love what to was, hear it from you. what started yes. what was the the you know what ignited that yes you know the the well uh the, the stadium where we play we played uh our matches uh the summit i'm probably so much of the summit Oh my God! The summit right. means the world. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know how far is that to the main center? That's right. How close it is? It's the backyard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I didn't realize the main center was there. So, so, so for those who aren't from Houston, sorry, I, I just want—I don't want to leave anybody out of the conversation. So, the main center is the is the headquarters of uh, the, the the major um, umbrella organization in Houston, known as ISGH, uh, Islamic Society of Greater Houston. And so, when when Hakim says main center, uh, that was always like sort of the original mosque of like where it all began. Um, in fact, I remember Brother Hakim kind of if we if we were to pivot our like not pivot, but to position where you are and where I am. Um, I moved to Houston in the late seventies, early eighties, I'm sorry, early eighties. And at that time, you know, even though we were living almost in Sugarland, we would have to drive to main center on the weekends. We would go for Sunday school and things like that at main center. So you can imagine that drive uh, yeah. as someone who, I don't know if you still live in Sugarland, but you used yeah, to. Yeah. I mean, so my parents would drive us every weekend to Sunday to go attend Sunday school at the present location 
of where Main Center is. And, and it's called Main Center, by the way, folks who are listening, because it's on Main Street. <laughs> so nothing too creative. Uh, in fact, there was a time in 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 uh, mosque history in Houston where all the all the mosques were named after the streets they were on. Um, so, for example, no, it's, you it's heard. Not, of- it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's not on Main Street. It's East Side. Oh, East. Side. I'm so sorry. Yeah, You're yeah. right. But it was yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so I'm so sorry. It, it, I was thinking ahead about no. about, about Sinon. Yeah, yeah because yeah, so so Senate becomes Senate Mosque because it's on Senate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Main Center because it's You're the right. Headquarter. I'm so it's sorry. Main That's, right. That's, main. right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah, no, look right at that. I mean, I, I'm, an, I'm an old man, Hakeem. You're older than I am, and your no. your memory, mashallah, is so sharp. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, no. But what what was the was there yeah, an event? The, yeah. yeah. So, so I didn't realize that the main center was there, which is uh, really it's about two three minutes drive from where, where, where we play. We practice there. We play games there. I didn't realize that we have a mosque that close. So. One day uh, after practice, one of the workers that that clean that cleans the uh, the floor ar- around the stadium, you know, I was going to my car. He asked me, you know, you know, are you a Muslim? I said, yeah. He said, how come we, we never see you at the masjid? I said, which masjid? He said, the main center is two uh, about three minutes from here. I said, there's a mosque there. He said, yeah, of course. You don't know. I said, no. He said. You know, he gave me the time for Juma. He said, I will come and meet you. We go to Juma. I said, of course. So I, we uh, practice around, the, you know, from 10 to 12, the proper timing. The, the, the salah is at one. So the, the gentleman, was, he works there. So he came. I, I followed him. Then... I, I, I was you know, always skeptical if it's not if it's nation of Islam or just the main, you know. So when I saw people, different people walk into the masjid, you know, I saw all different nationalities. So, so I was very comfortable. I was just amazed how close. I said, I said, Alhamdulillah. It was, because after practice, I can just, it was perfect. So then I went, as soon as I walked in, I saw how everybody was looking at me. Because they know who I was, but they know that they've not seen me in the masjid. They were surprised that, you know, I'm actually uh, a Muslim. Then, you know, Sheikh Rashad, very, very wise. He saw that. He sent two of the brothers, which is Faiz and uh, Asan, Asan Talbot, both of them, to call me to the office. After Salah. But when I walk into the masjid, then they made the Adan. I've not heard the Adan about two, three years. I could not believe. I was so excited because I saw everybody, I saw different people, different nationality. The Adan, the masjid is very close, very comfortable. Then the sheikh after 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 salah, you know, he sent two people to you know to invite me to the office. I went to the office. Then uh, he was asking me questions about, you know, what how do you find us? So they were just so excited that uh, I came in. Uh, then. Uh, he, he, he gave those two numbers, uh, those two brothers, as to make sure that I have the right people around me, not to get wrong information and you know all this, all the to have the right brothers with the right understanding of Islam. Then he gave me a lot of books, in the Quran and the books. Then also the alaka to go and study with the sheikh. And that's the best time of my life, where now you start Islam from the beginning. It's like what you were doing in Nigeria is without knowledge. Now they're giving you the fundamentals, the five pillars, how it applies, and you know, basic. They start to learn the, the, the letters. 
So all of a sudden, I became a student again. So I love it. When I go on the road, we have so much time when we travel. In the hotel, on the plane, so much time. So this time was the best where you can read, you can study, you can practice your writing. And uh, if we're in town, there will be Alaka with Sheikh Rashad, you go to the mosque. So this time, it was just like, it was a huge uh, 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 gap that was being filled with the right information at the right time. I mean, it was just, and you see, it was at that time, you know, in Ramadan, they bring, you know, they bring the, the shiuk from, from overseas, you know, as you know, previous you now it is in Ramadan in Houston, you know. That's right. That That's time, right. The, just, just the experience of, you know, the Muslim, you know, community, you know, as a family environment, you know, it's amazing. It was amazing where, you know, I felt so comfortable and I started my transformation. Then all my, then I went and I found out that, okay, you know, uh, silk, you know, is around for men, okay? So all my silk shirts that I design, I love design. I buy silk scarf and I design my shirts. You know, I said, okay, I, I can't wear this anymore. <laughs> then all of, a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, all my gold watches and gold bracelets and things like that. So just, you know, it's amazing. Those things, when, the, when you have the correct understanding, it, was, it wasn't a, you know, a, a major factor to, 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 to change. So what was it then that triggered that that re-exploration of your faith? I'd love to hear about that. I've heard different versions about you going to the masjid and whatnot. Um, but uh, tell us about how um, how that all played out. Yes, uh, our stadium that we, we used to play, you know, our matches called Summit, the Summit. And the main center is the headquarter of... Uh, is the umbrella for all the massages in Houston, ISGH. And uh, basically, it's about two, three minutes drive, that close. You can walk there from the summit. And I didn't realize that that was there for many years. So one of the walkers at the stadium, you know, after, the, after practice one day, I was going to my car. Then he asked, uh, uh, are you a Muslim? I said, of course. It's, then he asked me, how come you never, you never see you at, 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 at the masjid? I said, which masjid? And he told me the main center. And it's about two, three minutes away. I was, uh, I was very surprised that, first of all, he knew I was a Muslim. And uh, asked me, how come you never see me at the masjid? Then uh, he said, well, Juma, you know, is at one o'clock. I can come here, you know. He works there, so I work on Friday. So after Juma, you know, after my work, I can go. So we met after practice uh, on Friday. So I followed him to the masjid. And uh, as soon as we uh, we pull, I pulled in, and I saw a lot of people from different backgrounds. I was very, very comfortable because I was always concerned it's not one of the nature of Islam. Uh, so that was my hesitation before, before I expressed that uh, when, I, uh, when I saw that this is what I expected mm-hmm. to be. So I was very right. comfortable to come out and say, you know, yeah, I'm a Muslim. I, you know, this is my faith. Uh, I embraced it. I was missing it. And that was when the journey, that's how my journey started. And uh, the Imam, Sheikh Rashad, you know, uh, was very... God bless him who has passed away, but yeah, Allah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So he chose uh, two of the brothers there to be around me so I can get the right information, you know, right Akida, right, you know, so just to, just to have the right, correct information about Islam, to learn it the right way. Right. So then I started taking classes with the Sheikh, you know, going to Alaka, you know, and this this time was the best where you take classes, then, you, you know, you're learning how to read Quran in Arabic, 
then when we travel with the team, we have so much downtime on the plane, on the bus, and the hotel. So this time just been filled with all this new knowledge and information. So it was great time where I, was, I got so excited, embraced Islam in a very way, in the way where even though I grew up in Nigeria with Islam, but I didn't really understand Islam as you now you take it as a subject, you know, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a way of where you you read something and you implement it. You read something and implement it. Then you find out about the silk, the silk for men. All my silk shirts, you know. Start, I went to my closet and start clearing my closet with all the silk. <laughs> out of the you know, <laughs> I, I have these memories. I, I think people forget. Uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, and I don't want to embarrass you again, but you used to be voted consistently one of the best dressed of the NBA. Like I don't, I don't know what magazine used to do this. I don't think it was like Sports Illustrated. G- but- GQ, GQ. Oh, GQ, thank you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you were voted, uh, yeah, one of the best in the NBA, one of the best dressed. So, um, but yeah, silk and, and the prohibition of gold for men, so, yeah, that then, became an issue, right? Then, then the gold and the, you know, so all the things that you become now, you know, I, I used to, I love design, design my gold, my gold bracelets and watches and stuff. So all that, you start to just, once you, once you know that this is not allowed in Islam, you make that change. This not allow you make that change. You know, it's amazing the, the how Islam, all of a sudden, you align and you start growing and embracing it and loving it. You know, so you know that how that's how I started. Then it just yeah. growing, you know. And it translated on the court, right? Because we saw we saw kind of a a second version of Akeem Olajuwon on, on the we court. Did. Much more kind of at peace, calm, and your game just elevated to the next level. Uh, so let's talk, let's start maybe transitioning to that era, kind of the 1993 era. I know, I believe in the 93 playoffs, you had a really strong run against the Sonics, but I think it ended in seven with the Sonics winning, if I'm not mistaken. And then the next season um, with the team with Vernon Maxwell and Robert Ory, Sam Cassell, um, Kenny Smith, of course, Otis Thorpe, you guys started the season 15-0. and 0. And this is again. This was kind of a a new version of Akeem Olajuwon. The team seemed connected, lots of chemistry, and things were going r- really well. So let, let's dive into that season. Um, and of course, you know, uh, lots of big men. David Robinson, uh, Shaq is in the league. You know, it's uh, funny. Yeah. When you said fifteen and zero, you know, I, uh, Hakeem, I, I thought of the commercial. Uh, for Apple Tree, I think, for the grocery store. And, and, and Brother Hakeem would say, unbeatable. And that's what we were. The Rockets were yeah, yeah. Unbeatable. unbeatable, baby. <laughs> we were 15 and 0. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. So, and, and so I'd love to hear, I mean, was, was, was did you feel, going even going into that season, that um, this was something special? Or did it just kind of happen? And then while, you, you know, as it was happening, you were realizing it. What what went into the, the, the what, what was the, kind of the, the prologue to that, that great run? Uh, I, I believe it, it's uh, when we lost to Seattle game seven, you know, that the flight back to Houston, about four hours, it was silent. Nobody, you know, none of the players are talking to each other. We're just silent. And I think that was, that carried over for the, for the following season. It was a painful loss. Because we believe that uh, we are a better team, I mean that, that was a championship team, but we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't get there, and it was very painful to all the players. You can see, you can see the commitment going to that summer, preparing for the season, for the, the next season. So the following season, from right from training camp, the, everybody see that bad taste, where. You know the commitment, and the everybody come to camp in shape and committed to the team. So you can see it from the from the training camp from the beginning that uh, everybody are committed this year to to win. And uh, it was not planned, but you know preseason normally preseason you take it easy like you don't want to get injured. 
But no, not this season. This, from pre from preseason, we play like we already a regular a regular season uh, game. Then uh, we started the regular season, uh, won the first game and two, you know, the second, and just you know, eight in a row. Then we have to go on the road, you know, defend, make it nine and ten, and we went all the way to fifteen. It was a very you know, then we'll, we after we lost 16, so well, let's start again. The winning streak, you know. So that team, you know, we have we have a lot of uh, committed players, which focus in winning, and we play together just like that. And uh, in fact, somebody mentioned that that was the only team. I don't know if that's true. You can check the record. That was the only team that won. Championship with only one All Star. Yes, yeah. Only I mean, especially now, right? Because these days you see these super teams. Yeah. Um, it's it's, it's you need at least two or three All Stars on a team, and uh, yeah, you were you were the only All Star. Um, so, you know, very very uh, very different back then. And I'd love to hear about who you who on the team you were close to. Who you know? Who you had kind of a stronger relationship with, and 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 then liked playing with as well the most. Well, you know, you know, on the team, you know, on the on, in practice, on the court, I have a, a, a you know good relationship with all the players because you know they are watching the transformation. They see you on the plane. You you know you read a lot. You know, you're very, uh, you're very serious, and at the same time, you have fun on the court. You, you joke with them, but we cannot really have like a real close, close friendship because the lifestyle is different. Mm. You know, so and it's not like a, a, a judgment. No, it's just you know, they're watching, and that's where the respect comes from. They see that you know you're not acting. Uh, this is what you believe. This is your, this is real, and you are serious about your faith, and which is, you know, uh, this is one thing about what Islam protected you for a lot of things like you know, you know, gambling, you know, drinking, things like that, that were is to them more like on the plane to a gamble or drink. I mean, we have drink in our locker room. It's normal, mm. Mm. you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, things that they see that uh, is far, you're far from that. That's, that's, is, 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 so we cannot have a real close relationship except just, you know, acquaintances where we, we they know that we have teammates, tremendous respect for, you know, for one another. But just a casual relationship where, you know, just what's going on. Yeah. You know, just, just, just a basic. But we cannot say we go to dinner together or come to my house or go to the house. No. Mm, okay. you know, that, was, that was not there. Interesting. And, so, and, and it's amazing also, you know, that it's a lot of players today, when we talk about how it is on the road, how lonely some of the players get, people think they were, everybody goes to play together, you have to be close. No, not really, because you know everybody have their own life. Right? Is there is there anybody? And just fast forwarding a bit, and we'll come back. I definitely want to come back to nineteen ninety four. Is there anybody from either your days in the NBA or any anybody associated with the NBA that you're very close to still? Or is yeah, it again uh, more uh, of a Clyde, business? Clyde, Clyde Dresden. Oh, really? Yeah, Clyde Dresden. We know from college. Yeah. You know, from college you know, all the way to the post. When when the following year. When Clyde came to the team in '95, right? You know that was different. You know I was uh, because I, you know, very so close from college, and that continued till today. Excellent, excellent. Clyde so 1994, the yeah, Clyde the Glide. <laughs> 1994, <clears throat> to me as a fan, again, I remember exactly where I was watching in the 90, 90, 1994 playoffs. I feel the the birth of what was deemed as Clutch City happened in the Phoenix series. Um, basically I believe they won two games on the road and, uh, and then you, and essentially you guys came back, uh, after being down in the second half 
of game three. And I think between you and Vernon Maxwell going off for 30, 30 plus points, that I believe is 34 points. Um, that was the turning point. That's yes. where probably as a fan anyway, yes. I said, this team, I think this team can win it all. I mean, they were good in the real season, the, the regular season, you got the MVP, but that was that, that game I think was what I call the birth of, of clutch city. I don't, I don't know when that term actually was. No, born. no, you, you are absolutely right because, you know, we were better than that team. We had uh, the home court advantage for the for the old league. We had the best record, mm-hmm. and uh, we were we were we were beating them. We were, we were winning by twenty points in the fourth quarter, and the, you know people, the players, start to get too comfortable too quickly by. Change the what got us there, how we played as a team. Then the selfishness by not playing as a, team, as a team, not making the extra passes, they came back. So we lost the first game after 20 points in the, first, in the fourth quarter. Then the second game, the same exact way, we lost 20 points again in the fourth quarter. So the city, the Call us Choke City. Mm-hmm. We were the Choke City. <laughs> we lost, I remember that. Yeah, yeah we, 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 we lost. We lost two games, twenty points. Now we we now we uh, we lost two games going to Phoenix. So at that time, now we're on the road. At that time, now we know that we are much better team. We're beating ourselves. So now everybody's against us. We shook city. It was embarrassing to the city, you know. So we went to Phoenix. From the beginning, the focus now is to win. And that's why I say you were right. That was the turning point. Our focus of the team now is just to win. You know, so we played, you know, Phoenix. They couldn't believe they won two games in Houston. How's that happen? So that's how we, we came back. We won two games, coming back home, then we become Clutch City. Yeah, love <laughs> we, it, love it. <laughs> we, left, we left, we choked City. We came back at Clutch City. Yep, that's amazing. <laughs> that, and- that, shows, that shows the, the, the loyalty of the fans. <laughs> You know, I, I, I have to I have to go on the record of saying this. Yeah, Houston fans are notoriously bad as far as, like, just losing faith very early on. And so I think that uh, you're absolutely right, you know. But, uh, but, but to be fair, I think at that time, you know, it was kind of also a case of, like, one spit and twice shy. Like, you know, the city had gotten their hopes up really high. Um, and so we just didn't want to be disappointed either. And so I think there was a little bit of that. But, yeah. I can blame them because we blew twenty point lead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. To go on the road, and yeah. we're thinking, okay, this is it, right? And uh, yeah, so uh, but yeah, Clutch City is born, and um, Omar, your memory is a lot stronger. Yeah, yeah. Than so I mean, so, I know. I, I what are their memories the, getting us to the finals? Yeah, yeah. I believe you beat the Jazz, and then the finals uh, with the rematch with Ewing, the rematch of the championship yes. uh, from college. Eighty four. It, it, it yeah. went. It, it was a very intense series. I know Sam Cassell stepped up. I'd love to hear your, you know, your 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 highlight memory from that series. Obviously, the block against John Starks. Well, let's Perfect. get you there. Can tell yeah, your story. because you can. Yeah. That was a that was a tricky that was a tricky uh, series because uh, you know we were we were down two one uh, I'm sorry the Knicks were down two one and then they come back uh, and take a three two lead in game six uh, or getting us into game six so uh, and Perez, was, you were there at game six right I was at game six but I want to I want to hear from Hakeem uh, yeah uh, the only the only NBA Finals game I've ever been to ever brother Hakeem was nineteen was uh, game six of the uh, ninety four series wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good anyway, choice. I, I want to hear from you. Yeah, good choice. Who knew at that time? I mean, when you, when you look at the uh, ideal matchup, you know, where the both both teams are equally matched. You know, our right. strength, our strength, which is inside, is their strength, which is Ewing and myself. Then the power forward, Odie Stop and the Oakley, John Stocks. 
with you know with uh, with uh, Maxwell. So the all the positions were match up e e evenly, and that was a true championship. That's how championships should really be. You're right. You know, because we didn't have any any advantage. They didn't have any advantage. So we went. And, and, and exciting. I remember as exciting he, as the West went Coast. All, he went all the way to game seven. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It went all the way to game seven. And, 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 and that that is when you, you know the advantage of the home court advantage. Ah. That's what that means. The home court advantage. We won that series home court advantage. Because you, you don't want to play game seven in New York. <laughs> so, yeah. the, in, in, in the true sense, he exemplified the home court advantage. You know that is, you know, when you play against a team that you have no any advantage over, and a lot of big plays from their point and from us, you know, and of course the famous block, game six on a, on a John Stocks. Because the way he was playing that 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 game, that game six was amazing. He was. He, he was, was on fire. He was, he was on fire. It was not it was not missing. And just Alas Matala, you know, the victory from Alas Matala, you know, as you know, you know, game seven, he couldn't buy a basket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. You know? right. So he couldn't buy a basket. I love <laughs> I love it, brother Hakeem. Thank yeah. you so much for for saying that. Um yeah, so it just just reflections here. You know, I remember like what I was trying to say. Like, you know, I the uh, on the East, you know, they're they're the the Knicks had their own very you know had a had a great run against Indiana. That was a great series to watch. Yes, you know, just the back and forth between Reggie Miller and like Spike Lee. Uh, you know that 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 all came yeah. about, right? And I say Spike Lee in, in particular because one of the other highlights I have, Brother Hakeem, from Game Six is I actually got to meet Spike Lee. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, in, in the uh, during halftime, we were walking around the stadium and we uh, around the summit, and I saw Spike, and you know, he had just for us, he was right off the press of uh, hot off the press of uh, Malcolm X, right? So. Yeah. You know, I remember shouting to him saying, Assalamu alaikum, Brother Spice. And, 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 and he, he replied back, Walaikum salam, my brother. <laughs> so it was really nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I met him and I met Bob Costas. But anyway. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so funny. Game six, uh, Hakeem, like I remember you could literally hear a pin drop. Like I'm not even exaggerating. The summit was silent when Starks lets go of that shot. And it was like at the buzzer and you had nicked it. Like it was just, oh, that was. No no pun intended, I guess. No, no I'm sorry. No pun intended. You, because it wasn't <laughs> even like a full rejection block, but you got enough palm on it, enough hand on it that, that you, you, you essentially deflected it. I mean, it, it was not, it was a surprise uh, pick because Ewan just, oh. it, it just went from the post I ran to send the pick for, to to uh, send the pick on uh, on Maxwell. So I have to make that switch to get there, uh, and uh, I was I almost fell. Then recover because it was wide open, you know. So just enough to just you said just enough to deflect the shots. So yeah. yeah, and I'll be honest. Like I said, as a fan, you know. We all go back and watch things that make us feel like kids again. And watching highlights from 94 and 95 definitely is one of those things. Oh, for and, me too. Um, for, me too. <clears throat> for me, for sure. Yeah. And uh, I think you 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 went off the, the opposite foot to, to leap to make that block, right? Well, I, was, I, was, I, I almost fell. It was a surprise pick. Yeah. I didn't expect you to run out and say the pick on, 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 on Maxwell. Yeah, that's amazing. So, alhamdulillah, mashallah, you got the championship. You had the... Well, uh, well, pause. I, I gotta, yeah. I gotta, I gotta ask. Like, how was it going into Game Seven then? Right? I mean, you're, you're, so like, uh, what, 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 what's the temperature like? What's the feeling like going into, uh, you know, potentially now, this is it, right? We could clinch yeah. the title here. So, I, I would love to kind of have you kind of share that. I mean, uh, the uh, Game Seven, you know, yeah, where you've, we've, we've battled this team. And you you know you know how tough they were, and uh, now the whole season, they come down to just one game. 
Can you imagine right. that? Can you imagine the whole season comes out to one game? That's what I'm saying. I remember that. Yeah. Then, then the 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 the, the, the night before was very very difficult to sleep because you were so charged up. You know, you're ready to play. And you try to go. You know that you know that you need your rest, so you can, you can have energy. But in the back of your mind, you just can rest. You know, so you know, it was go for Fajr. You know, read your at card in the morning. Do all your ritual that you know normal. Uh, but in your back of in the back of your mind, you just keep thinking about they just get it started. <laughs> you know, um, if I'm feeling that way, I'm sure all of the players have to feel the same way. Right. You know, so coming into the locker room on TV, but that, that's a, that's a, uh, we have a TV in the locker room of, of both, both locker rooms. We can see their locker room and ours. Oh, yeah. wow. I didn't know that. So, okay. so they were showing, they were showing, uh, The, the the trophy, you know, on that side and on this side, and the players are getting ready. So, you know, we don't know who is going to take it. And it was amazing to say, uh, this trophy is in, is in Houston. Can you imagine they flying this trophy back to New York? <laughs> you know, you can <laughs> imagine that. So you, right. you were locked in that, uh, you know. But then, after, if after Fajr prayer, you know, you, you, I was, you know, like ready to submit that either way, I'll be grateful to Allah SWT for giving me the opportunity. So I was so grateful. That's why after, after, after that, after that championship, I went to, I sat in the corner, you know, thanking Allah SWT because I made that dua earlier in, in Fajr. That either way, I was, you know, I, I pray that Allah SWT to, to give us victory. But either way, I will always be grateful. And I, and I, when I saw the outcome, that's why I gave us victory. I was being grateful and thankful to Allah SWT for that victory. So I was, yeah. that's why when everybody was jumping, I just yes. went, you know, side, quiet for, for, for a few minutes there. Yeah. And that become, that become the highlight of the, uh, that whole Yes, suit. it but, did. Yeah. People that were talking about that, what were you thinking? They didn't know what was the story in the morning, and I see the outcome now. I'm just being thankful to us at that moment. So, uh, Brother Hakim, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing that story because I, did, I didn't know this, and I'm listening to this for the first time from you. And so, one, we're just honored to be on the receiving end of that story because, like you said, a lot of fans saw that moment after the victory where you just sat in the corner in reflection, that's how yes. we saw it as as, yes. as viewers, as fans. However, to for you to give us that backstory, you know, tying back to the fudger of that morning yes. is beautiful. And if I could, and if you would indulge me, like, and I don't want to embarrass you, but I have to share this story because this is something that will be one of the highlights of my life, um, and one that I've told my children many times is. Um, we were watching Game 7 at my friend's house. Uh, we were actually watching, I even remember it was my friend Omar Sami's house. And I remember when Maxwell hit that shot, that three, and we were elated and we already knew, or we were we were thinking, okay, this is too good. The Rockets are not going to blow this, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that was a huge moment of victory for us when, when yeah. I remember when Maxwell hit that three and he falls to the ground and, yes. and Cassell and, 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 and uh, uh, yeah, like it was just, it was just a moment, right? And uh, yeah. anyway, then like you said, when we saw, like we were still, we were like almost awestruck when the game was over and we won. But I remember that moment watching you on TV in reflection, and we said, you know what? We well, we were so excited. We knew what we wanted to do, which was we wanted to go celebrate, you know, with the rest of the city. And, you know, and so we were we were we we, we headed over to Westheimer and Richmond thinking, okay, that's where all the cars are gonna be, and we're gonna just celebrate this amazing moment in the history of Houston. But we said, you know, before we do that, let's go offer let's go pray. And it was enough of us. Like we were like a group of like 10, 15 of us. 
we said, we're going to go to ISGH. We're going to go to the main center and pray Isha there first. And then from there, we'll go to, you know, <laughs> to, to go celebrate on Westheimer and, and, and Richmond. And, uh, you know, Brother Hakeem, we roll into the uh, ISGH main center and there's only one car in the parking lot and it's your white Mercedes. And we said, we said, subhanAllah, like, we're like, Hakeem's here. He is here. And when we walked into the, into the masala, you were already, it was the, the main center wasn't open. You were praying in the outer room. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yes. You probably remember just as well as I do. Um, and we, we came into the room and you were already in prayer and we just joined you. And we, you obviously knew that there was a jamaan out behind you. And you led us in prayer for Isha that night. And uh, it's a surreal moment. I mean, Brother Hakeem, we'll never forget it. Me and my friends to this day, we talk about that moment. And and in fact, when I was telling them very excitingly about having you on the show, we all began kind of like what Umar said, right? We we, we all began to relive those days and those moments. And so I can only imagine what it feels like for you. But uh, uh, as you know, from the bottom of my heart, I mean, thank you for all of that. And thank you for that amazing memory. Well, mashallah, thank you. Man, uh, but I need to say something because, you know, you know how people, you say people have impact on each other. Now, the, the impact that you have on me. Oh, please. No, seriously. Because you were the, you know, you were the youth leader. I was amazed that how active you were about, you know, your passion for Islam. And you, as a, as a youth, that been just like you said earlier, that you know, going to the masjid, I've been active. It's what is cool. And that's why you know you're so outstanding. You were surprised that I, I haven't seen you in a long time. When I saw you at the Eid, as soon as I saw your face, I said, "You were surprised that oh, you remember me." Of I course, did. Because you have that impact, and I know that you know when you left Houston. I said when we lost, a, you know, this is a big loss to Houston. Because what you were doing at that time with the youth, and now you know at your adulthood, and you still, you know, like what you're doing right now. I mean, I know that you, you know, you, you know, your, I mean, your, your vision and your passion. You, know, you do, you actually, you accomplish something great. You know, I mean, I felt that. Um, so I'm very, you know, honored. Now you give me this opportunity to to even you know to talk to you guys about oh my it. god I'm, to support to support whatever you know what you're doing because you have that impact on me I remember you know what I mean you were doing the you know the work for the youth for the future and the future is now thank you brother I came that means a lot I mean I, I I'm just I didn't yeah, yeah. if if the if people could see you know there was a video with this audio like I I, I don't even know what to say <laughs> I, I'm really speechless here. Uh, you know, that moment you, you that you mentioned at Eid, you know, it was like, you know, like you, you always talk about like getting street credibility with your kids. So I remember my daughters were standing to the side and I, I walked up to you and I said, you know, I, don't, I, I hope he remembers me. I kept telling my kids that because I, I, did, I wanted to, you know, set expectations, you know, and I remember I had to take off my mask a little bit so you could see my face. And the minute you saw my face, you recognized me and you said, immediately, Brother Brother Brother. And you, immediately and you hugged me. And then I remember going back to my daughters and my daughters were like, they were for a moment, they're just awestruck. They're like, okay, so dad, (laughs) dad, you know, dad, dad knew this person. It wasn't just, you know, all this talk or whatever, you know? And so uh, I thank you for that. Thank you for making me uh, be an all-star in front of my daughters. (laughs) Uh, But but you are, though. You know, you are, you know? Thank you. You're real all-star. No, no. Thank you, you brother. Well, yeah, come, yeah, come. That means a lot. Um, uh, so how do we, does like I don't know how do you transition from that, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I'll just step in to say, you know, th- like I said, this was a bucket list item for me. Uh, ma- ma- thanks for making it happen. And, and like I said, I just want to echo uh, the graciousness that Barbez has expressed, uh, Brother Akeem. Super, ha- super happy to have you here. And and like I said, you re- you really were, whether you, whether you totally understood it or not, like I would say a lot of guys in, in America – between ages and 35 and 50 <laughs> growing, if they were basketball fans, yeah. you know, it, you had a, you had a huge impact on them. I, I you know, and, and you may not have fully understood that, but, uh, 
uh, I can I can probably speak for a lot of a lot of no I think uh, you can speak for like you said a a whole there's there's a whole generation of people of our vintage of our age Mm -hmm. who attribute so much of our coming to you know our own sense of identity uh, tied directly to you know you know brother Hakeem because Hakeem was so you were so vocal about your faith and uh, expressing it you know I remember I like you know the, the before you started playing the game you have to understand. We were too young, or I should say, sorry, not before you started playing the game. Before you, 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 you rose to the levels you were at already as an athlete. But when you began expressing your faith very openly, you have to understand. For there was a whole generation of us, we were too young to appreciate the time of Muhammad Ali. So we were too young to appreciate Ali and his greatness. And for us, I remember, and 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 again, I, Umar, I think I speak to like a whole generation of us when I say this. Like it was Kareem Abdul Jabbar, you know, in the 1988, was it? Like when he, when they were celebrating in the locker room and, you know, they interviewed him and one, he wasn't celebrating with the champagne, like they weren't spraying champagne on him. And he said, I think, Allahu Akbar, right? Wasn't that, I think that was 1988. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And those were formative periods for us. Like in terms of our hearing Allahu Akbar on national television, I don't think I had ever heard it in that context. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, post 90, just kind of moving along in post 1994, the, you know, now we have the 95 season. I'd love, I'd love to just to, I know we're, we're getting close on time here, but I'd love to talk a little about that because that was the year where you weren't expected to win it again. The team had went through a lot of changes. You brought on Drexler and that was the year that Rudy T coined the phrase, never underestimate the heart of a champion. And that's because you did something that no team has ever done, which is win as the sixth seed you beat. And I can, I can literally tell you from memory, you beat the jazz and then you beat the, the Suns. Uh, and that sun series was when, you know, I'd love to hear your memories about the, the Mario Ellie's kiss of death shot. And then you beat the, the, of course the Spurs against the, the MVP of that year. Uh, and culminated with with beating Shaq. I'd love to hear your memories because we were all having uh, you know uh, high blood pressure <laughs> watching those very exciting games. Some of the best games I've ever seen. That's right. I'd love to hear your experience of that year and and how you you know how you really made that happen. That was a that was an amazing accomplishment coming from the sixth seed. I mean, that, that is, it was a historic. You know, both championships have uh, their own uh, merit and. Uh, I tell people all the time when the uh, some of the fans they say because Jordan was not there our championship. I said, well, '94 Jordan was there because they lost to Orlando. Mm-hmm. He was there. They said, well, he played half of the season. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was a you know that big steal that they made on Jordan. Uh, in, in, against Orlando with uh, Benny Adeway and, uh, and Shaq. So he, he was there in 95, in 90, 90, 95, 95? Yeah, 95, yep. He was there, yeah. But the the real uh, accomplishment is coming from the sixth seed. That's never happened before. It's not whether Jordan was there or wasn't there. That was in the story. Coming from a CC, that something that has never been done before. So that's I try to I always try to just bring that attention to that what was accomplished. You know, uh, the, the, we made a huge uh, trade for Clyde towards the end of the season because they see that this team was not going to do was not going to make it. Then, just for many, many years, when I, when I, when uh, I, when we play against uh, Portland, and after the game, Claire and I would go to dinner, where he would dominate, dominate his, you know, for 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 his team, and I dominate for my team, and we always have this conversation about. Can you imagine if both of us played together on the same team? Man, that would be a championship. We said that for many years. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. So this now, 
I'm not supposed to give us that opportunity now. We're on the same team. Oh, I said, well, you know, so to myself, now we have to, oh, we, for many years we've talked about this now. Now is a, we have to make it a reality. <laughs> so it was a new commitment from, from both of us that we believed that when we said that. And now we have an opportunity to, to, to prove it. So the mindset of the team having Clyde, you know, new blood to the team. And we just want to get into the playoffs because we are, we were really out of the playoffs, really. We just don't get in. And we got in now uh, as the last you know, the sixth seed, playing all the teams that won 62 games, great teams, you know, against, uh, was it Utah, the first game? Yeah. Utah and then um, Phoenix again. Phoenix so again. Stockton, Malone, Barkley, and then, of course, David Robinson, and then right. culminating I mean, with we, Shaq and Penny. We went through all the major the team uh, where without any home court advantage. We had to play all the games on the road, all the, all, you know, we don't have any home court advantage. And uh, that's why it was a, it was a very special that – victories from Alas Matala because it's never been done before. Up to today. And Ver- 94 versus 95, which one is more special to you or are they just different? Different because yeah. 95, 94, we, we, we had the own call advantage. We, want, we had the best record in the league. Yeah. So that was expected. But 95, we were the sixth seed. It was not expected. Right. <laughs> so, you know, but it, even though it was not expected, we expected it. We believe you know, we can do it. If I could ask you as like the perception of the fans of Houston, you know, both after the 94 championship, but especially after the 95 championship. And I don't want to gloss over the fact that you swept the finals. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we definitely want to, you know, highlight that. I mean, that was huge. Uh, like, like Omar mentioned, Mario Ali's kiss of death shots. I'll, I'll never forget that. Um, I was engaged at the time and I remember I was watching it at my in-laws house or my, 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 my future in-laws. And, you know, I, I was still trying to make an impression on them, but I just remember after <laughs> that, <laughs> they're huge Rockets fans too. So we just all just celebrated and like all like that quorum of trying to make an impression went away. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, but, uh, I wanted to say like, as Houston fans, we always felt that the team, that the, that the Rockets, the city, that we never got the love and the admiration because I think that both New York in 94 and Orlando in 95 were the media darlings. They, they were the darlings of the NBA and, 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 and both times the Rockets beat the media darlings. Did you feel that as a player? Like, did you feel that the NBA had its narrative or the media had its narrative, NBC, whatever may be the case, right? Did you ever feel that as a player, or is that just us yes. the fans kind of yes, feeling that? Yes, yes. But I would not say NBA, you know, because NBA is Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right. The NBA is independent because NBA, you know, they're, they're, they're you're right. all, you're all right. the teams. Absolutely. But the, but the media, you know, of course, they have their favorites and uh, who, they, who they would like to see. Right. Yeah, so, you know, but... That was into their wishes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and and I'll be honest. I mean, the, the, the media, you know, going back to the media, you know, they gave us enough fodder to feel that way because if you – and we already skipped over the 94 – or we already discussed the 94 championship. But game five of the world uh, – of, of the championship was, of course, the same day as the famous now – um, you know, O.J. Simpson, White Bronco, Speedway, tra- uh, you know, freeway chase uh, happening in Los Angeles. And so I remember very distinctly, again, to the to the upset many Rockets fans, certainly and NBA fans, I imagine all over where the media had to go back and forth between covering the Bronco chase and game five of the championship. And, it, and, and there was a moment or for most of it, NBC made the championship screen smaller and the and the chase screen bigger. And so I remember just, again, as fans, you know, you felt so upset by that. And then I, I, I can't remember if it was after 94 championship or 95 championship that, that Sports Illustrated 
only did a limited release uh, championship edition, like like with the Rockets. It was only released like regionally, only in the South. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. And so that upset us as fans a lot. Yeah, of course. We were playing uh, in the, you know, I think we just won the Western Conference Finals against San Antonio. One of the biggest matchup, and, you know, and the sport is traded. They came out why uh, University of Miami, you know, something about football, you know, as a cover. They put it as a front cover where it was a basketball season. It was the NBA finals. And, you know, this is where where we deserve the cover of the of, of first sports trade. So it's always, a, you know, we, that's, I felt that too. I mean, this is something that's, you know, it's not, into, it's not into their, it's not in their hands. If it's up to them, we won't be, <laughs> so we won't be in, in, in our, in our position now. So a lot more time, you know, you know, give us that uh, honor. Yeah. It's an honor <clears throat> for us where they don't like it, but they're forced to put us, to do a, they have to come up with a special edition to make up for it. But yeah, but I mean, the great news is these days, you know, whether it's Twitter or just social media or even YouTube, I do feel, alhamdulillah, like you are getting recognized as a uh, top five, top 10 player ever. Um, like the, the conversation, things have become more clear, I think, to the to the NBA fan, you know, the, the NBA fan base out there that Akeem Olajuwon really is a top 10 player. Um, you're not... At least from what I've seen, you're you're consistently on those in those conversations. So that's that's great to see, right? Oh, Whereas yeah, some other yeah. players have fall, fall, kind of fallen, people have forgotten about him, or they fell, fell off the radar. You you you, uh, alhamdulillah, you haven't. Mashallah. So awesome. Move, moving beyond those those just wonderful two championships, I want to fast forward a bit. Um, 1996, we know the Bulls come back and win the championship. Off that off season, Rockets management decides to shake things up. You had you had amazing chemistry with Ori and Cassell and some of the some of the supporting cast, uh, but the Rockets management brought in Barkley, and uh, that was a that was a pretty exciting time. Again, the Rockets had a really solid year, and you made it to the playoffs. I would I would I know specifically remember I remember watching a January nineteen ninety seven uh, Sunday game on national TV. I believe it was Ramadan, and the Rockets did in the last five minutes pretty much. Uh, going like a 20 or 0 run and, and beat the Jordan Bulls that year. So the, 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 there was a lot of optimism in the year. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that season and um, your your excitement of, and about the potential for, for meeting and beating the Bulls in, in the championship that year. Uh, we didn't play the Bulls in the championship. That was, a, I think, it was a, a national game. Yeah, Sunday yeah that's game. It was that, a that's February. February. It was a yeah. February, but yeah. Right. He, he, I guess he's just highlighting we, it because he, yeah, loved, Jordan was back. We, yeah. we, all, we always love to play Chicago, you know, in Houston. You know, we have a, a track record against Chicago where when they come in with the winning streaks, we hate for them to go to San Antonio or Houston first. We want them to come to Houston first to break that uh, winning streak. And that's one thing I, I respect about that team, the Chicago team, because it's amazing that uh, I, I, when I look at that team, from my own perspective, when I look at look at that team, uh, their 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 weakness, which was inside, so I look at that team as being weak. But their front court with Jordan and Pippen are very very strong, but they were they weak inside. So we always exploited the inside game against Chicago, and also the same thing with San Antonio with David there. So, in fact, when uh, Pippen came to our team, that's what he said. We hate coming to Texas because they know they're going to lose two games, Houston and San Antonio. You know, so, uh, uh, but I guess uh, to answer your question, when we trade, trade, for, trade for, for Barkley, you know, this is somebody that you've competed against all this time, you know, and you know his reputation about, you know, talking. So now to be on the same team is very uh, different for me in the beginning because it's always on the opposite side. Now we're on the same team. And both of, both of us play, you know, the same, we like the same 
uh, side of the block. So after I adjust my game, you know, sometimes when it is down there, to be on the other side and still be affected, you know. So uh, that game that you were talking about, you were talking about against Chicago, uh, Barkley was injured. So he didn't know the history that we have, the tradition we have against Bulls. So he was on the sideline watching that, that game. And that's what he made his, his comment. That was amazing that uh, I was fasting, not drinking, and, and he see the performance. So he, he testimony, that was his testimony, that he made that game so much uh, bigger than what it is. Right, memorable. Yeah. Yes. And, and as a team, I mean, you must have been pretty excited because I think you made it to the Western Conference Finals and right. it went we lost six Utah. games. Yes, yeah. Utah. The last, the last, I remember the last shot by, uh, what's his? Uh, Stockton. Stockton, yeah. Stockton, of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that was really close. There's a lot of optimism there. Did you, that must have, that must have been the time where you felt closest post the championship years, right? In 1997 to winning? Yes, I mean, you know, Utah, you know, when they won, uh, 62, 62 games, and we won only 42 games. And we made them in the first round in 94, 95, 95. 95. Yeah, we took that from them because that was their championship year, Utah. Mm. That was their year. And, you know, and it was amazing that every team that we played, they said that was their year. So we, we beat them in 95, which was their year. So by then, beating us ninety seven, it was more like you know, you know, you can't you can't win all the time. So one day it's yours. Day, so I took it very well. You know. Nice, nice. I was and a, then I felt bad that with Barkley, but he came to us to win the championship. I know. And we couldn't deliver that. So I, I was, you know, I felt you know for him really. Yeah, yeah. And right, then because he it, he never he he never got a ring, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. But when it came, that was it. That was it. Made was, purpose, you know. Right. And, uh, it didn't. It didn't happen. Yeah. You know, and then the Rockets was, management. That was disappointed. That was disappointed about, about that. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely a bit of a heartbreaker. Breaker. Yeah. Um, exactly. But and then Rockets management seems was aggressive. They brought in Pippen a couple years later, um, and there were some chemistry issues. And it was a strike. I believe it was the strike shortened the season. Um, what, what was your experience there? Well, you know. Before Pippen, it was Clyde. Clyde was without his Barkley. So they replaced Clyde with Pippen, you know. So the the chemistry, it, I mean, the way I, I think when you have too many superstars on your own team, then you take turns. It's not, instead, of, instead of playing like a team basketball, everybody takes, okay, first play, my play. Then second play, Barkley. Then third, then, I, then I'm, I'm waiting mm-hmm. for my turn again. So that the flow was not the same. But still, you know, we managed to win some games, but not the way uh, when we put those talent together. It didn't work out the way uh, people were expecting. You know, that's why when you have too many superstars, then uh, less of role players. It's always better when you have one or two then you have a bunch of role players that play in their role very well that complement in each other. But when you have too many stars, everybody has to sacrifice, try to make it work. Then you have a superstar playing a role of a role player. You know, and that's... And that's just never a good fit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and, and they don't feel like they're uh, being utilized to the full capacity either, exactly, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So it's tough, uh, on the, it's tough on the coaches to blend uh, that. Right. You know, <laughs> so you have to put, you know, the coaches in the in a very tough position, try to please everybody, you know, but that's, it's, it's just too many. Yeah, we need role players that are more superstars. Right. So I, I guess moving ahead a couple of years, then um, you um, uh, I, obviously like there, there's two fact like, like there's two things that happen. I mean, you know, you're moved to Toronto, but then more importantly, you know, you 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 decide um, to uh, you know what was meant to be, I think, a two year kind of a, a arrangement. You you retired after that first year uh, of playing in Toronto. 
Um, so I, I guess like, how, like, was it beaters like bittersweet leaving Houston? And then, you know, obviously the bigger question, you know, were, when, 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 when retirement came knocking, were you kind of ready to retire? Were you, did you feel like, you know, did, yeah, how, how did you feel about retirement and, and, you know, and whether it happened at the right time for you? Yes. I mean, you, you always imagine, you know, even five years before, you know, how, you know, when will you retire, you know, basically. But you ask some of the players, you know, how do you make that decision? We say, well, you will know. Because if it's something that you will come to rea that realization that it's time. And uh, for me, about basketball, you feel like, man, I can still play. I feel comfortable, you know, my, on my skill, I can still play. And I would like to play as long as I can contribute. But uh, the curiosity also, by being in Houston, you know, from college, and the professional career all these years. And I've always wondered about the players that sometimes they play in so many cities. That's, that's you know, because when you when you live in that city, you get to know the community, the people. Right. You know, it's, a, it's a transition that you that I've never experienced. And it's always curiosity, you know? So I said, my last year, yeah. I like to play somewhere else. Just, <laughs> just, you know, just to, you know, to experience another city, even though my base has always been Houston. So then uh, the Houston Rockets, you know, was trying to more or less force me to say, okay, if you'd like to play one more year, the contract issue where something that's more like insulting kind of uh, offer. Mm. Thinking... I love Houston so much that we not go somewhere else. You know, that's the mentality. So then Toronto came up, you know, opportunity came. But the structure of the of the contract it was really a year one year contract. Oh, okay. Right. But for the salary cap, the structure for three years payment payout. But it's to pay to play one. That Got was it. the that was the understanding. Sorry, okay. Yeah. So that's what happened. Now, when the Toronto, you know, huge Muslim community, right? Unbelievable, you know, uh, the, when I the experience. Okay. Now, basketball, basketball wise, you know, now we went with Ben Scudder was on the team. I said, "Oh wow, this is going to be great." And then the the team that tried to build a team around outside player. Which I'm coming from, where you go inside out. Now they try to go in, outside in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So basketball wise, you know, it's a, it was a big change for me. Where you know we bring the ball, we, we bring the ball, ball down the court before you settle. Somebody already take a shot. You know, you can't take a shot where you are not even established the inside game. So that was a, a very uh, uh, difficult. Uh, to accept. Well, to accept, yeah. To accept, yeah. As, not just as for me personally, just for basketball perspective. Mm -hmm. When you have a presence inside that command double and triple team that can open up the shot from outside, from inside to outside. So you have to explore that. You know, but when you settle for, when, I, when people shoot threes, which is, today's game is different now. When you shoot threes as a first option, you know, that's like you settle. You settle for easy, easy, because you always do that. So you have to explore the inside. Yeah. To for the outside. So but what you, this game, which is totally different now, where you know, I will let you go. Maybe maybe I'm jumping forward. On, on this. No, no, we can we can I'd love to get your today, thoughts today's about game, today's game. Yeah, what do you think about it? Basketball wise, for example, I I see players that Running uh, with basketball on the fast break and pull up for threes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's amazing because in my time, 
if we do that, if we will make it, the coach is a bad shot, a bad decision. Right. Because because lay, you know, for, for, for fast break is a short thing. Exactly. Three you can still miss. Right. But you're then, giving up an easy two for a potential three. It's exactly. always a bad yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So they right. say, so see, but when they make it, they keep quiet. They say, well, I guess a good shot. <laughs> but when you have Steph Curry, that shooting, because that's a layup for him. Three is a layup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a it's, different game today. I mean, uh, yeah. there's very few big men. Um, and it's all, if, if even the big men are really expected to shoot the threes, some, you know, you hear, 30, 30 plus threes in some in some of the games these days. So it's, it's definitely a b- different game than it was. Right, but I think I think uh, uh, the fundamentals of the game remain the same. If you have a big man that can, you know, take advantage of the post as a coach, you will not uh, you know you will not ask him go outside and shoot threes. Because that's, that was, that. you know, who's taking, who's taking advantage, advantage of, the, of the post? Players like Westbrook, Kyrie Ivey. They play the post because they're guards, but they post, they have their post game. They, they, they kill all the, all the, all the little guards in the post. That's right. So the, the, the opportunity is still there for who can, who can utilize it. So if, if I'm a big man, I can utilize that. You don't have to shoot in threes. So, so do you, do you have a favorite player? Uh, do you watch any players these days? Oh yes, I mean, not a favorite because there's so many uh, talented players, you know. I know uh, you uh, enjoy just to see the, the skill level, or uh, how everybody have their own uh, flavor. So I like to see some of the creativity of some of the players, you know. So I'll, like Kyrie, for example, his ball and his skills, and his post moves, and the way. He plays, you know, it's just so artistic, you know. And of course, uh, James Harden when he's with the Rockets, how crafty, you know, on a consistent basis, how easy to score for him. So the players give you all kind of different uh, angles to look at their their, their 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 talent. So for me, instead of having a a favorite player, I look at his talent level, you know, compared to, you know, to measure, to qualify him as, wow, he's a guy, he can play in any era. Or I can look at the player, you know, he's playing well in this era, but he will not play well in our era. So you look at it from that perspective. Yeah. And and so just wrapping up on the basketball side of things, you know, you, you got uh, congratulations, of course, on the, the Hall of Fame in 2008. Amazing career, mashallah. You inspired you know all all young youngsters but also of course muslims watching and um like i I mentioned earlier in the podcast consistently now mentioned in the top 10 list um Mm -hmm. so alhamdulillah mashallah awesome awesome career we're we're really happy to have watched it yeah thank you so much i think i missed the question i didn't answer that question i just i just remember now the retirement the oh right, yeah. yeah. I didn't yeah. answer that question. How do I come to that realization? It's time. I, I didn't answer that question. You know? Okay. What happened when I, when I was in Toronto? Then, uh, on the bus, or on the plane, then you see some of these players that when I was playing, they were in high school, junior high school. They were watching. Now they can't believe they're your teammates and they're sharing their experience. That you, but you know, when I was. Then I realized that it's time to it. <laughs> it was time because these guys were watching the high school, and you know, you know, in the middle school, you know, they realized that I've been there too long. You know, it's time to. <laughs> and you can relate, but so it's time. To, it's time to. Yeah. It's time to retire. You know? yeah. Right. And I was and I was ready too. So yeah. basketball wise, I feel like I can still play, but I think it's time to do something else. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I, so, I mean, you know, as we're kind of closing out, like Omar said, like basketball uh, and and just the uh, top, you know, the conversation in general. Um, I, I, I would, I would feel remiss if I didn't ask you who you consider kind of the greatest of all time, like in your opinion. Um, and and it doesn't have to be necessarily 
the greatest center, just maybe player. I, I don't even know if you can do a top <laughs> one, but yeah. but yeah. No, that is, that is true. I, th- I think that question is really is for the fans. The fans can just you know it, the way I, I mean. If you put it overall, you know his question is say is a Jordan Michael Jordan as the greatest player because I would say because he benefited the most from basketball than any player off the court, on the court. So you can look at it from that perspective. Mm. But from basketball, pure basketball, you, you, I can answer the question, if you build in a house, you say, which one is more important, the plumber or the electrician <laughs> or architect? Or, so because it's different specialty. That's Jordan right. cannot play our position as big men. And we cannot play his position. You understand? So it's a two, you know, so, but we, we put it as overall. Yeah. You know, in our era, it led, it was the face of the league and we supported a lot of superstars, but it was a global icon and it benefited the most up till today. So in that sense, you have to put everything together. You will say, yes, but Jordan is, you know, is the, is the, you know, because when you look at statistics wise, how can you compare Jordan with uh, with Chamberlain? With Chamberlain did things that he, today nobody can even come close to. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in all aspects, you can't come close to that. So you put him in a league of his own. Yeah. Well, you're yeah, our favorite. Yeah, yeah, you're compare, our favorite for yeah, sure. Compare, That's for yeah, sure. Compare Kareem, Bill, <laughs> Bill Walton, but Bill Chamberlain. He's in a league of his own because yeah. things that he did. It's someone that averaged 35 rebounds, scored 100 points. Mm-hmm. I mean, he just did some things that were, where they say, well, the league is smaller. Or you can you look, know, that was his era. But as I say, in overall, Jordan, you know, his style of play, his competitiveness, his popularity, you know, his achievements. I mean, so in that sense, you say, well, like a Jordan, I will support that. Well, like you began the, answering the question, you said it's really up to the fans. So um, like Omar was saying when you were talking, um, from the perspective of these two fans, like, yeah, you're the greatest. Uh, no, no. <laughs> you're the GOAT, mashallah. No, no. I'm not, for sure, I'm not for even, sure. I'm not even trying to be. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, when, yeah. No, when no, no, say, of course you didn't mean it. You know, when fans saying, you know, the greatest player, you know, say, well, what position? Right. right. You know, it's two different, you know, it's, uh, which one would you rather choose? You want, you rather choose an electrician or a plumber? Yeah. Or a and roofer you're... or a foundation? Yeah. And, and Jordan did say that if he was picking a center, he would pick you. So that, that's, that's, wow, on that's, the record. That, that's, a, that's a huge, uh, huge compliment from, uh, for, for, for a, a, a player like that, you know, so. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, you know, as, as you know. Yeah, I love playing against him. You know. So you mentioned um, having a relationship with uh, Drexler, Clyde Drexler. There's a lot of young uh, Muslims in the NBA these days. There's a handful you read about. Um, have you, do you have any relationships with any of those guys? Whether it's Yusuf Nurkic, Ennis Cantor, or Kyrie, or any few, of those few, guys? few, like, uh, you know, uh, Kyrie for sure. Kenta is very active. Yeah. Very active in the community. You know, so, you know, I've met with him a couple of times where what he's trying to do on a, on a, on a grassroots level with the Muslims. So he's, he's, I think he's one that's most, most active, uh, you know, in his movement. Try to, I know, uh, he, he suggested the idea that uh, to do so a camp where all these Muslims are uh, athletes come together to see what can we do to impact the, the youths, the Muslim youth in America, which is, I think, you know, I thought it was a great idea, you know, to have that, uh, to have that camp where we don't know what we're going to do, but we just get together and now let's figure it out. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, plus, you know, when, when, I, when I read the article about uh, the Muslims are fasting, remember that? I was surprised there's some names that I didn't know they were Muslims. You know, I saw some names. I saw two names from Boston team. That I didn't know they were fast. They were Jalen Brown. Yes, Jaylen I didn't Brown. know that. So, 
is to also to encourage to encourage them that uh, as Muslims, it's not uh, it's something that you don't have to hide that. You know, it's something that to to be proud of because you have a huge supporters out there that that we're so glad that you're Muslim. They that they have to know that the Muslim world just just by them stepping out as a Muslim, how much more they be so different from all the other Muslims in the NBA, all the other players in the NBA just being a Muslim. So yeah. that also needs to be to be uh, encouraged. You know, like you mentioned the idea about the camp, and I think it's a wonderful idea, and I think that would be great. You know, it's uh, just doing the show for as long as we we have done it. Um, you know, we've been honored to have you know Mahmoud Abdurraouf on the show. We've been honored to have Bilqis Abdul Qadir. Just just basketball, yes. but obviously there's there's Muslim athletes in other you know sports, and and I'm always reminded how important Muslim athletes are as someone who doesn't watch as much sports as I once used to. Um, but, you know, it, it's uh, just based on social media and what have you. I don't watch, like, for example, MMA wrestling or, you know, but I know how big of an impact Khabib has, like, right, yes. on, on the Muslim youth. So I think uh, I, I'm just disconnected from that reality. But I think uh, I think it would be great. I think it's a great idea. You said yeah. I think Cant- um, Cantor. It was, it was yeah. yeah, his yes. idea. Yeah. And I was also, uh, it was also refreshing to hear you mention Kyrie Irving or you having a relationship with him because I think as someone still new to the faith and kind of navigating his way through the, you know, through yes. re- his early embrace of Islam, having a sobering and, you know, someone who's been a lifetime Muslim like yourself, I, I, I think that, like, that bodes really well, inshallah. So, inshallah, yes. Thank you for doing that. Um, so, you know, and, and it's funny also that, you know, it, you're always like a step ahead of us. You're, you're still just as quick and agile um, because, <laughs> you no, know, you have because like Omar was going to ask you about, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was a couple of questions ago. Uh, oh, yeah. He, he was going to ask you about what your thoughts were on the league today and you already were, were there. And it's funny because one of the things we wanted to close out with was something that was more recent, uh, was that sports, the uh, Sports Illustrated article that came out um, on the anniversary, I believe, of 9-11, um, where you, Ibtihaj Hajj Muhammad, uh, I think Bill Qis, uh was in that issue as well. Um, and and so it's just great to see that you're still as relevant when, you know, when we talk about Muslim athletes. Um, but yeah, if you have any experiences or thoughts on, on that article and and, and, and what we can do. Any yeah. thoughts for the future? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this would be kind of the way you're a closing message for our, our audience. Well, I think, uh, <laughs> that's, you know, the, 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 the task for the, for the, uh, for the Ummah, I mean, for the American Muslims, uh, is huge. And the opportunities uh, are also great. Exactly. You know, tremendous opportunity that uh, I mean, look at America, you know, on a global stage, and uh, we will say the Muslim, American Muslim, as, as in, in front line, really, because whatever happens in America affects the world. So our presence in America, you know, is crucial, and uh, the vision for the leaders. I think I see the Muslim community, you know, today, uh, you know, working together more and more in, uh, you know, a lot of different areas. But I think, you know, I'm focusing on the on the on the youth, where for the youth to to understand the value the value of, you know, Islam in the real sense in in, uh, in the life of a Muslim, and to take uh, Pride in those kind of uh, value instead of the instead of uh, the peer pressure, you know. Because a Muslim, when it's time for certain principles, you're going to stand out, and these are the things that uh, make you unique. And uh, if you want to blend in, then there's no principle, you know. So the, the, the encouragement. That's why, you know, uh, to have a lot of youth program, not just youth, really, you know, the, everybody, just 
I said, you know, family breaks down. The importance of family, because, you know, when you see family, you know, in today, in the society, real family, it's a DAO by itself. Yeah. It's a strong DAO. And they see consistency from a Muslim family that why is this community the mother, father, children, you know, consistently? Even a young Muslim, he's 25 years old, he's married, he has kids, he's professional. I mean, things like that, I think, uh, is to be shared and valued, you know, to be to continue. Where not just talking is action and what people see, you know. So, uh, I've, I when I retired, I went to Jordan. That's right. I went to Jordan. I went to say I want to learn Arabic. Mashallah. Yeah. So I went to Jordan. You know, I put my kids in school in Jordan to learn the, to, to pick up the Arabic. You know, which was I think very very important. Uh, then coming back to Houston, you know, letting them know that you know you spend all this time to acquire Arabic, we can lose it. Yeah. You know, people. Then I see youngster youths here are studying Arabic here and speaking Arabic fluently without traveling. I say, why am I traveling over there? I can learn it from here. So that's part of America. You have everything. Now we yeah. have all different schools. So we have responsibility where we can impact, you know, what happened with the Muslim world. You know. So yeah, true. I would just say, I hope everybody, just like what you guys are doing, to continue any area you can add value. To do your best you can. Thank you, thank you. Um, still, still continuing to inspire, um, Brother Hakeem. Uh, it, it's it's just always one, a pleasure to talk to you and to hear from you. Uh, as you know, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything you know wrong with admitting this to you in front of your face, but just for two two young people growing up in the '90s. Um, you really were an inspiration. And, and, you know, we were coming of age, Omar and I, people of our vintage or people of our age uh, p- uh, who were growing up in the 90s and coming of age, you know, you were a tremendous influence and impact on our wow. lives. So so thank you for that. Um, I, I think Omar would but, share but that. It's, but it's your problem. I keep telling you. It is, no, I know I mean, you did. Omar, I, you, Omar, <laughs> please. I, I, mean, I met Omar first. I'm telling you. You know, you don't, <laughs> you know, is is energy? What about the youth? At that time, at that time, the youth have not been the same. It's like we talk about the NBA league, right? Say so when in the 90s, they're the best. Your time, the best of the youth program. You know, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, and that's why I saw, when I saw you from from, from first, the first day, and I kept watching all the programs how you develop. When you move out of Houston, you went to Oklahoma somewhere in uh, uh, Arkansas. Yeah, Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. And you have a great that, memory. That was a big loss. Uh-huh. <laughs> big loss. Thank I mean, you. I'm serious. You know, it's amazing to see a, a, a youth with that kind of mind. From it's not just something I just knew from that. From that I saw that. So when I when I saw him again uh, recently, he was surprised. I'm, I said, "Where do you?" <laughs> Because you have, you have that impact. You don't see, I mean, you know how you meet some people sometimes and you know that you have, you don't forget that person. You continue, you know. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank no, you. No, that that and, means uh, a lot. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can't adequately express you hearing you say that and what that means to me. Thank you. Jazakumullah khair. You know, thank you so it's, much. It's mutual. It's mutual. No, really I'm honored. I'm honored. You know, yeah. I, I, I have to say, just because I was thinking about this when you were talking about, you know, the Muslim community and the impact that we can have. I remember one of the highlights of my life. Yes. Do you, do you remember after you won the first championship, um, all of the national Muslim organizations got together and they oh, met in Houston? Yes. You're right? Yeah, yeah, Omar, yes. Omar, I don't know if you know this, Omar. Yes, it, was, it, was. it was a historic moment because you had, I think it was Dr. Muslim Siddiqui was the president of ISNA. You had uh, uh, you had Imam Jamil al Amin. You know, may Allah make it easy for him and yes. give him health and Ameen. freedom. Ameen. But he was the head of his community. Imam Warathin Muhammad, may Allah have mercy on yes. him. All of these amazing leaders, Doctor uh, 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 Mujahid uh, Abdul Malik Mujahid was the president of Ikna, and they all got together to uh, you know essentially honor Hakim. Unbelievable. That it was, was unbelievable as someone who got to attend. Uh, mashallah. And, and I remember, I think the, the, the Chronicle 
did a front cover story of you when you first entered. I think that picture, that shot was like on the front page of the Chronicle. Oh, unbelievable. And also the, 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 all, the mayor of you, all the, all the politicians of the city. I mean, they did, I mean, the community, that kind of impact that they did, they, they, I mean. Yeah. I forgot about that, but that no, was, I'll never uh, forget it. It was at the. Uh, it was at the. Uh, I don't even know if it if, if it's there anymore. But it was like the uh, Hilton, sh- uh, uh, or sorry, I think it was the Sheraton on on like fifty nine South. Yeah, exactly. It was something like that. It was but anyway, Southwest Hilton actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that just it just really brought that a, memory yeah. back. I had forgotten about that. But, uh, you know, again, you talk about, you know, like what I mentioned, Hakeem, and I meant this sincerely, like just growing up, you know, um, and seeing that and just seeing the community get together. I mean, that was inspiring just to be in attendance of that. Um, But uh, Omar, Omar, I mean, you know, I've been kind of hogging up the stage. Um, (laughs) No, just we're just just, catching up. We're just catching up. We're just catching up on air. Yeah, exactly. No, just really (laughs) want to. Again, like I said, this was this was uh, no pun intended, a a dream, uh, a bucket list for me. Like I said, I grew up. as I told you, watching you, and to be to this day, if I'm if I have a couple minutes at night and the kids are asleep, I'll put on some YouTube top ten team <laughs> highlights. <laughs> I have your your some of your moves memorized. Oh, I, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So. I really enjoyed the, the post. I know. Uh, inshallah, we can also in the future if you have another angle, we can we can we would, catch up on not basketball or another thing. We can always do that. That's Just right. Keep, you know, no, thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you so much for making the time to make this happen. This was really, again, like, well, I think pun intended, a dream for both of us. Um, and uh, yeah, we wish you the best. And uh, th- again, yeah, you really honored the show for like, like, like by, by uh, being on it. And uh, I'm honored. I'm honored. Jazakallah. No, no, well, yeah, Jazakallah. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, thank you. And um, let me look at the time now. Let me see what. Let me see. <laughs> I was close. I was close. It's remarkable. Oh. We're at 34 minutes. I know. Well, my timer says 34. That that's from Allah. That's from Allah. 30. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I try to make it under 30, but Allah, you know, had other plans. He said, "No, you're going to end on 34." I can't. I can't compare 34. I can't compare 34. <laughs> Nice. The winning number. Uh, thank you always for listening, uh, folks. Uh, if you want to send us comments, feedback, uh, you can email us at uh, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Uh, hit us up on uh, Facebook um, and check us out on social media. We hope you enjoyed the episode and catch us again for the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Sorry. Sorry.